This is Jocko Podcast number 236 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. When I went through basic SEAL training, there were two people recognized with an award at the end of training. The first award was for the honor man. And the honor man is the guy in the class. I think it's for the best sort of overall performance, which is mostly physical. Running, swimming, obstacle course, pull-ups, sit-ups, whatever. Whatever other physical events you do, life-saving and not tying and buddy breathing and pool competency, and you kind of have to just do good at everything. And not just good, you have to do really good at everything. It seems like the honor man is going to be one of those people who did some kind of athletics in, in high school, maybe even college. In my class, the honor man was a complete badass. His name was Keith Kimura. Total stud. He, and I don't remember everything about Buds, but I remember that he won just about everything. Although there was one other guy that was always right there with him, but somehow Keith must have edged him out enough times to become the honor man. I never was close enough to the front of the pack to knew to know which of those two guys won, but obviously it must have been Keith. Because he was just pretty much savage at everything. And even after SEAL training, he... He pushed himself hard, tried to maintain that edge. And after his first tour at a team, he went back to Bud's to be an instructor. And on January 10th, 1997, Keith was practicing breath holds during an evolution with the students in the dive tower. And the other instructors were, they were working with the students and they were running the evolution and they weren't tracking Keith who was down at the bottom of the 50-foot tower holding his breath. And at some point, at some point he passed out. And and because he was just sitting down there almost in a meditative way, no one really noticed that he had passed out. He took on water. By the time the other instructors recognized what had happened, he was unconscious. Unconscious. And he never, he never regained consciousness. And he ended up dying the next day, January 11th, 1997. A better man than me. The other person, the other award that gets given out at the end of Buds is called the Fire in the Gut Award. And I I don't know if there's some kind of official definition for this award, but it seems like the award was given to the individual that had to dig the deepest to get through the training. And who in doing so also inspired and motivated the rest of the class. And in my class, class 177, that was another badass man. A guy by the name of Jeff Higgs. And his journey to BUDS, to basic SEAL training and through basic SEAL training is a pretty incredible story. And because of that, you know, we're, we're brothers. But we're brothers not only because we went to Buds together, not only because we served at SEAL Team 1 together, but also through jiu-jitsu. I'm, pr- I'm, I'm pretty sure we both started the jiu-jitsu journey the same exact day. And we are connected through our jujitsu lineage because Jeff Higgs eventually got his black belt. 
he gave the black belt to Dean Lister. Dean Lister gave the black belt to me. And I guess we should include that there's also a connected lineage here to Echo Charles, who then received his black belt from me. And it's been a while, but it's an honor to have Jeff here with me today to share his experiences, his knowledge, his outlook, and his lessons learned in life. Jeffrey. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate thanks it. for coming on, man. All right. Always good, always good to see you, to hear you. I heard you at some pretty, I heard your voice at some pretty traumatic times in, 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 in my life. Yeah. So it's always good to, uh, to, to sit down with you. Obviously, we trained a ton, but let's start at the beginning. Let's start at young Jeff Higgs. Where were you born? I was born in Ramsure, North Carolina. It's um, a town like almost smack dab in the middle of the state, pretty and, rural area. And what was, uh, what was the situation there? Like what was your mom and dad doing there? What was the uh, scenario? At the time, my, my parents were separated. So I was, you know, I was, you know, my mom had me there and moved back to New York when I was about three. So was she, was she a New Yorker originally? No, my mom's from that, that town. And where was your dad from? My dad was born in the Bronx, grew up in Harlem. And so then, so they, had they moved down there together? Or no. were they already split up and she took you down? Yeah, they were split up. And uh, I wasn't born yet. So I was born down there. The rest of my family was born in, in New York. And then, and then you moved back to New York at what age? Three. My mom moved back. So at this point, I hadn't really met um, my father. Um, and my mom moved back to New York. And then it was a, kind of a whole family issue thing that I wouldn't want to get into publicly. But uh, my dad got custody of me and um, ended up growing there with my father and going to my mother's back and forth on weekends. Mm -hmm. And then whereabouts in, in New York were you living? So I grew up on uh, Staten Island in a place called West Brighton Projects. So that's where I lived with my father. And um, my mom lived in another project called Park Hill Projects. So a lot of people are familiar with that. Stapleton, Park Hill are right next to each other. Like the Wu-Tang Clan mm -hmm. is from Stapleton. <laughs> um, from yeah. from uh, West Brighton, Mark Mahomes area, there was like the Force MDs. There were some people who had come out of that area that had gotten fame. And then, like, uh, I remember when I was a kid and I would take the train down to the city. Mm -hmm. And we would go by, you know, I'm coming down from New England, from Connecticut, you know, whereas in, in the sticks, you know, I grew up on a dirt road. And so we'd be on the train, me and my buddies, and you'd be going through the projects for, it's probably, it seemed like about, maybe 20 minutes of riding the train where it's just building, 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 building. Uh, you can tell that they're in rough shape. And, you know, I would always be sitting there on this train, for, you know, coming in from a really rural area and looking in there thinking, that looks rough. Yeah. Yeah, all the projects very much the same in um, the Northeast area. You know, they're rough areas. So what did your dad do for a living? My dad um, worked with, like, um, housing. So um, he didn't uh, have too much education. But, um, you know, he did what he could, and uh, he worked in the housing department. So he worked in, the like, for the projects for the city. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I remember, like, uh, as a kid, he would take me into these uh, big boiler rooms. Like, we'd go down underneath the building and you know, for it's winter in New York, you have these boilers that heat the, the buildings. And the, the boilers are huge. You know, you could see the fire in there and you'd show me how to, you know, show me the gauges and all that and how to operate. It was pretty cool. And and did you what I know you have at least a sister. What else did you have for siblings? I have three older brothers and two older sisters. So I'm the youngest. The youngest. Yeah. Were all that were all of you co located in the same house with your dad? Uh yes and no. There are all kinds of uh situations <laughs> going on in there. So I'm not really 
going to be divulging my family history, maybe right. in a book or something. Like yeah, that. <laughs> but but so it was pretty much some of the kids that were around some of the time. You're around. Sounds like you said weekends with your mom, but the rest of the time with your dad. Yeah, and for the most part, my uh, my brothers and sisters, we were with my father. Okay, and I visit my mom on the weekends. And then, what, what were you doing? Like, what were your interests? What was going to school like? Okay, um, as a kid, I was um, very thin, and I had like an, an incident happen, like I guess like in second grade or so, where I got really sick. Like, um, I got sick in front of a bunch of people in school, and uh, I was just really embarrassed by it, and I didn't want to get sick again, so I stopped eating a lot. So I was really thin, but besides that, and that and that went on for a long time. I would eat, eat so, much. So what grade was that? That's like second grade. Mm -hmm. So you got you mean when you say you got sick, you mean you threw up in front of a bunch of people? Yeah, we were doing like this play, like the <laughs> Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, something oh, yeah. like that. Oh yeah. And uh, I was just I told the teacher I'm like I do not feel good, <laughs> and she just let me sat sit there, and and uh, then I was like they put out a bucket in front of me. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is New York in like you know late seventies, early eighties, and uh, and then it came. I just started, you know, going at it right there, and everyone in the class just scattered, and they were like, yeah! <laughs> just like pointing at me, and it was just like, is it? I couldn't do anything, you know. It was like I had no control, and the body was just doing what yeah. it was doing, and uh, I was, uh, I just kind of toned down my eating. And I would eat like just a piece of bread in a day. But I mean, besides that, I was, um, you know, really bookish, mm -hmm. read a lot of comic books, encyclopedias. Um, I was just reading all the time and pretty much like a pretty much a nerd. You know, I would walk around and that was that's why I was a target in that kind of neighborhood. You're definitely going to be a target. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to ha I used to carry this book in my pocket called uh, the Golden Guide. Golden uh, Guide? Golden Guide, you can still find them. And I even bought the book because, you know, just for uh, nostalgia's sake, but it's a little book of spiders of North America. <laughs> so that, you know, people used to call Random. me S spider Man Cause I would, oh, I would come okay. up, you know, I'm like this little kid, like, oh, that's Electrodectus mactans, and like saying all these species names of these, <laughs> arachnids, different types of arthropods, and people were like, this kid, you know. And I would collect spiders and go down and get ants and put in the web. It was like pretty twisted, I guess, <laughs> looking back on it. But, but that's gotta completely isolate you from like other kids, especially in the projects. Yeah, it's kind of weird, especially like, <laughs> my dad said I was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> You you don't do you think that like uh, when you were sick in front of all those people and you kind of got called out? It's funny because we're sitting here laughing about that, but that kind of stuff leaves a mark on kids, right? Yeah, it leaves a mark on kids. Do you think that left a mark? Do you think that's what made you kind of uh, become more into books because books couldn't laugh at you? No, I was I was into books before that, but I think it made me more introverted. Mm -hmm. You know because. Now the spotlight's on, but it's not for something good. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's laughing and pointing, and like a lot of people are just really disgusted. It was just, it was, you know, really stands out in my mind. So then, what was? It seems like you know you're reading books. You're kind of a nerd. What about like as you get older, as you get into high school? I mean, damn, you know, like I said, from me, especially in the '80s, you know, like going down to the city in the '80s. It was mayhem down there. It was total mayhem. Yeah. The drug dealers, the the pimps, the prostitutes. Like I remember we used to go out at night and, and you'd see like prostitutes at probably around 10 or 11 o'clock at night and they'd be out on the streets, you know, working and then we'd come back at three or four o'clock in the morning, we'd go to see a hardcore show or whatever, we'd come back later and there'd be those girls, they'd be out there, you know, turning tricks, they'd be looking like they've been turning tricks all night. I mean, how does a how does a kid that's reading about spiders get through that without getting dragged into it? Oh, I think one of the main reasons for my path in life was being the youngest in my family. I could see 
different mistakes. I'm not even going to say mistakes, but I just I'll, I'll say different choices that other people made. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll go this way. I think when you're the youngest, you may want to look to be distinctive because you're everyone's always telling you do this, do this, do this. And you want to think for yourself. Mm hmm. So I think maybe that's that's a reason. Were you getting any guidance from your older siblings that were saying, hey, you might not want to do this? Because the other thing, man, <sighs> this is such a negative way to look at human nature, but so often you see people try and drag other people down. And I, I, I mean, this was in the SEAL teams. This is where I know it from, in the SEAL teams, where you know, you'd know you have somebody that was trying to kind of move in the right direction and the other guys would kind of, drag them back down you know like they wouldn't want people to succeed and and that's not a blanket statement but I'm just saying it happens and and I could definitely see it happening within families where you know one sibling does start starts to do something well and the other siblings kind of grab them and drag them back down but I could also see siblings saying don't make that mistake go in this direction did you see either one of those or was it more just your perception of what to do and what not to do I would say my siblings uh, my brothers and sisters have always been really cool with me. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, I, I feel really blessed in that sense. You know, they always steered me in the right direction. And, and the weird thing was around the neighborhood, you know, I was known as like Little Higgs. And my other brother was a similar age. You know, we were uh, like, you know, the, they were like, oh, you know, look out for those guys. So, I mean, we would, sometimes I'd be walking by the lobby in my building and the guys the drug dealer is right there. I know the guy. He lives up on that floor. You know, you just know he sells drugs. He does his thing. And hey, what's up, little Higgs? You just walk right by. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never like uh, um, I never really felt like I wanted to get involved in that stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't really have too much of an issue. But I could see all these things going on around. And this is like in the in the eighties in New York City, which is very different than it is now. I would say, you know, it was definitely. A rougher time. Oh yeah. You When's know, the last time you were back in New York? Um, uh, mm, just this few months ago, oh, yeah. seeing my brother. Yeah. So yeah. I go visit my brother, and uh, you know he still lives in Harlem. So I'll visit him. Uh, you know, pretty much um, when I'm coming back from overseas or something, I just stop over there. Yeah, yeah. New York is a completely and utterly different place now than it was in the '80s. Never mind the '70s. I would never went down there in the '70s, but in the '80s for sure. What about, um, you know, one of the things <laughs> you used to tell us stories, me, I mean, you and I would sit down and talk for a long time when we were going through training, and you'd tell me stories about some of the characters in the projects. There was, I know there was a couple brothers that seemed to have, they seemed to be, they seemed to have their own, like, world that yes. you kind of brushed up into sometimes. It, is, it was just like, the, the. I mean, I remember these stories, man. Give us a little hint of those guys. What was their deal? So these two brothers, Mark and James, they just, uh, I don't even know what started it. Just They just had it out for me. Mostly James. And uh, <laughs> these guys would, every time they would see me, you know, they were high on something and they would make this sound like, you. <laughs> <laughs> And when I heard that sound, I was like, I, you know, I would start running. I'm, I'm guessing, like, looking back, they're seeing this kid with glasses on looking at a spider book in the corner of a building. And they're just like, target. And, you know, that's that's how it started. And, and this, I used to be in the corner just getting, taking punches from these guys. In the... It's so it started with them just saying, yeah, right? Yeah. And and that's how you'd know that they were coming for you. Yeah. And and it was also kind of a signal because in the projects, you know, each building is kind of like its own entity and like maybe a guy in another building, it's like a signal to, to that person. So you hear it like, yeah. and then <laughs> way in the distance you'd hear, yeah. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> It's a weird thing going on. <laughs> so the funny thing is, this is fast forward a little bit, but you know when we were going through SEAL training, Jeff, you would do that like yeah. at moments of whatever, <laughs> like moments of chaos where they're trying to get us to quit. All of a sudden, you'd hear. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it, it just needs to be said though. I was, I told that story to someone, and that person just started saying it 
over and over and then it spread so then everyone was saying it. So I wasn't like, you know, just randomly in butts like, you know, it's just someone started and then it just spread. And then it's like from buds, STT to the teams. Uh, so, uh, so when you get to high school, is your attitude change or is your attitude the same through high school? Very You're different. Of, what Very happened in different. high school? So when I was 12, um, my dad was a football coach. You know, I was doing like Pop Warner football and I was one of the worst on the team for sure and uh you know my dad was always trying to encourage me you know you got to try different things so try football try this try that and uh you know my dad one day I came home and um he was blowing his nose and when he pulled the tissue away it was just blood everywhere and like you could see like chunks and stuff like like didn't look right at all like you knew something was wrong and he was like, yeah, you know, I got a, a bad flu. And we didn't really think anything of it. And then finally, you know, I guess he went to the doctor and then we found out that he had leukemia. So that was in November and it just got progressively worse. So this is um, 83, late 83. And then he ended up, um, you know, going in the hospital to get chemotherapy back then was way more harsh. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from like November to like where he he uh, died in uh, January 4th. And uh, so it was just only a couple of months of this. But, you know, after school, I would come. Uh, I would just walk to uh, this hospital that he was in. It was on the way back home from the school and just watch. I would just watch my dad go from someone really big and strong and just watch him just shrivel you know, going through this treatment. So between the leukemia, the chemotherapy, then he got pneumonia from the, uh, um, just being, sitting in the bed, and uh, hepatitis from blood transfusion. You know, it was just a whole bunch of things happened, and then, uh, you know, he died. So you said that that things changed. Did that change your outlook on things? Did you Did you start to look at the world in a totally different way now? Yeah, I would say, you know, everyone has that that um, pivotal point in their life where, like, I guess you can say, like, innocence is lost. Like, it's not like, you know, a fairy tale in life anymore. You know, I basically, death was introduced really quickly, you know, early on in my life, and I just saw it. And uh, that changed me because I became even more introverted. More introverted? Yeah. So I would have maybe a friend or two at school, but you know, um, I would just be into my own my own world pretty much. And did uh, now where you where were you living now? I was still in West Brighton, uh, projects visiting my mom, back and forth. Was and, your uh, older siblings taking care of you, or so that's where it gets a little, you know, for my family dicey. But essentially, mm -hmm. I had a stepmom at that point and. I was going between my stepmom and my mom's on the weekends. And, it, you know, getting involved in the, you know, right after your father passed away and then you're going into courts and all these, you're in these rooms with these people doing psychological evals, you know, are you okay? And who do you want to stay with now, your 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 stepmom or your mom? And, uh, you know, it was just really confusing to me and uh, just kind of overwhelmed. I kind of like, in a sense, checked out. So, um, yeah, that's what happened. So are you, t are you still participating in school? Like actively like, okay, I'm, I'm going to graduate. Did you have some kind of plan? Are you, are you studying at night? Anything like that? Um, I'm not, no, uh, one thing about my schoolwork, I'm not like the best student, like going to school and, you know, getting grades and stuff like that. More, I just been following my interests. Now in the classes that I was interested in, I always did really well. In other classes, I may not even care about the class, you know. But I, so I was—I wouldn't say I was like studying, but I would just follow my interests. So your dad died when you were twelve. So you must have been in like eighth grade, seventh grade. What grade is that? Yeah, seventh grade. Seventh grade. So that was really pivotal because you know you get taken out of school because your dad died, and then. When you go back to school in the seventh grade, you're the kid whose dad died. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And every, you know, and and you know it, and you know everybody else knows it, and you're just kind of like you know to yourself more. So I had some good friends. Like I used to, I was into like. I had some nerd friends, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, that kind of stuff, you know. So I would kind of hang out with them, but it was only, you know, on breaks at school or something like that. And what would you do? Like, what would you do the rest of the day? What would you do in the afternoon? What would you do in the evening? What would you do on the weekends? Come home, like at that age, after school, come home, watch like, (laughs) what was it? Thundercats, (laughs) (laughs) picks. You remember that? Remember that? That. we, we had to go picks, picks, picks. Like uh, what was that? It was something to do. You had with, to win uh, these prizes yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah, I, it, that, you, you that, had to phone in, yeah, right? Yeah, you, yeah, someone yeah. had to phone in and call for fire by saying picks, picks yeah, on yeah, the yeah. local TV station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember that. Dang. That's, so yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was that was. You didn't have that echo, did no, you? No, it's not yeah. in the bill at all. Because you, I think you might be younger. Yeah. But so. and also I don't think they had that was like a local TV thing. Yeah, they had yeah. like a little echo. They had like a little call for fire. So you'd be on the phone. Mm. You'd have to call in and while then, you're watching TV. Yeah, man. and then it was like a video game of some kind where you had to drop bombs or shoot something, but at a certain time as it was moving. So when it moved, you'd say, "Picks, picks, picks," and that yeah, was yeah. like the <laughs> fire, fire. Yeah, which was like <laughs> maybe the maybe the channel. Like yeah. on TV, you know how it's like WLBN or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was WPIX or something. So you'd have to say picks, 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 yeah. and then you could win <laughs> whatever reward. <laughs> so now I know who was trying to call in. It was <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> well, that was the other funny thing about Mark and James is they'd see you, and I remember that's why that's why to this day whenever I see you, I go Jeffrey. Yeah, that's right. Because they'd see you and they call you out. Yeah. Did you ever reconcile some kind of relationship with those guys? Uh. No, because those guys are more like, you know, cool guys in a sense. You know, they were popular people and I was there was just really no connection. You know, and, and uh, it was really weird because in the projects, the, the atmosphere, you know, it's like R&B, jazz, hip hop. But James was like into metal. Him, <laughs> they were like maybe like just a fraction of people in there that, that were into metal and he was into metal He'd have Iron Maiden shirts on and all that stuff and just be coming after me. (laughs) 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 And he'd get me in the corner and just, he'd start punching away and then ask me, do you want the medicine or the treatment? And both were the same thing, just (laughs) more beating. Yeah, I remember you telling me you'd, you'd like be you'd think you have you think you would have made it past them or whatever, and you'd be going up the stairs, and all of a sudden you'd hear Jeffrey, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, there was another one you told me about something like you were walking. It was dark, and you were walking. I think you were walking down the stairs, and as you came down the stairs, w- one of them, whichever one it was, lit a match. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that was James too, and it's essentially, um, you know, every now and then you get blackouts, you know, in the city, and then yeah. we had this big blackout um, back then, and that's a problem because now the elevator might not be working. So if you live on the eighth floor, you have to walk up, and there are some elderly people that live like seventh, eighth floor, and so we're like, you know, hey, you know, get a knife, and you could make a dollar or two walking people upstairs and so you know I was walking people I walked maybe one or two people upstairs and then uh, I was coming downstairs and all of a sudden it's about magic (laughs) (laughs) and he just lit a match and uh, it was it was James and then more punishment (laughs) (laughs) it's about magic Uh, wonder yeah Take your breath away. <laughs> this is a Broadway play. Okay, that was I, going on I, that t- at that time. Okay, that part I never knew. All, all oh. I ever knew, all I remembered from Buds was it's about magic, wonder. T- I never, heard, I thought it was just what those guys made up. Psychos, just yeah, yeah just psychoness. <laughs> so, so these guys never, uh, you never reconcile with these guys. There's no story of revenge where you went back. Not really, you know. I, I was, and and I 
you know, looking back right now, I wouldn't even, you know, I don't really have anything for those guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just, I wish everybody the best. So, you know, all that stuff's past. What music were you listening to? Back then, um, I only listened to what was there. So it was like a lot of rap music, um, you know, R&B, um, you know, just neighborhood music. And uh, I, only, I got introduced to um, other forms of music. Um, by first, I played saxophone as a kid. So I played saxophone for like four years. So I was like, got involved with like orchestra. Like I would, my dad set me up for um, a summer program and I would go and play in a symphonic orchestra uh, for over the summer. So I had to like take out a bus and, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, take my saxophone along. It was, it was pretty cool. That and also uh, my dad liked jazz. So that was also another um, influence on, uh, you know, my musical taste. And then um, the kids, some of the kids I played Dungeons and Dragons with, there were some groups, like one group was like the Brewster Street crew those guys and then there was another group and these guys they were all into like metal and stuff because you know, when you go to um you know the schools over there are kind of like zoned mm -hmm. so they have people from different neighborhoods coming to the schools so these these were um these kids were not from the projects and they listened to metal and like when we would play Dungeons and dragons that music was there and i was like it just became normal so i was like you know and and also i wanted to I always wanted to try different things, you know, and see, you know, oh, what's that like? So I was kind of exploring. And um, so I started listening to, you know, any kind of music I wanted to listen to. Mm -hmm. If I was interested in it, I'd check it out. Now, at what point did you start thinking about the military as an option? Okay, um, after my father passed away, there was um, my father's good friend, this guy, James Harrison. Mr. Jim, we used to call him. He was, um, his son came back from the Navy. He was a regular guy in the Navy. And um, he told me about the SEALs. Because I think I'd, I'd seen, at this point, I'd seen First Blood. And I was yeah. like, I'm going to, my, you know, I started finding out about the different military <laughs> units. And so I'm like, my, my original plan was to go in the green, go in the Rangers then become a Green Beret. And then I heard about Force Recon. Then I'm going to go on the Marines and become Force Recon. And then once I heard about SEALs, go into SEALs and become a SEAL. Like I wanted to be all the special <laughs> forces. <laughs> but this, you know, um, Jamie, his son, that guy really changed my life because he told me about the SEALs. And, and I was like, wow, what? You know, the Navy, what are they, speedboat drivers? I couldn't think of what in the Navy could be spec ops. And then he started telling me about it. And um, I was like, man, that's like, I need to find out more about it. And so I went to the recruiter. And at this point, you know, I'm like, you know, mid-teens. And uh, I asked the recruiter about the SEALs. And he said, don't even think about it because you'll never make it. And that was like, that's when I was like, hey, you, oh, yeah? <laughs> And then I started, like, really focusing on trying to get into SEAL team. So Mr. Jim was, along with my father, they would teach boxing to, like, the kids, like, troubled youth and stuff. Mm -hmm. They had these areas, um, you know, they had a heavy bag. And my dad was a, a boxer. And, um, yeah, Mr. Jim started training me. I said I wanted to go into SEALs. And um, he's like, hey, you know, if you want to get into condition— Meet me down here on the park bench at four o'clock. And it's like midwinter in New York, snow and stuff like that. And he's like, if you're not here at four on the dot, I know you're not serious, you know, and we don't have to talk about it again. And I'm like, all right. And, you know, there I was the first time I ever like woke up early. Like, that was four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Oh, he's and, uh, a good test. I got out there. Echo would have failed. <laughs> <laughs> I can do 4 o'clock p.m. I would have been there at 3.59. Probably. But Mr. Jim, uh, yeah, he started training me, and it was like um, push-ups, dips on the park bench. And, like, when, when you go into the buildings in West Brighton, at least, there's kind of like this overhang, doing pull-ups on that. And um, 
He's like, you know, if you're going to be a fighter, you need to keep your hands up. That's the first rule of fighting. So, you know, we'd go out. There was this field across the way, and um, he'd have me running laps around the football field with bricks in my hands. And the goal was learn how to keep your hands up. And, uh, you know, the, the first few weeks is bricks. You know, I'd meet him like two, three times a week doing this. And then uh, graduated to like, you know, milk jugs, pouring water in them. And then the milk's jostling around as you run around, you know. And he really just, he just really instilled in me, you know, like you, you have to train. You know, if you want to, if you want to get something, you're going to have to work for it. So I, um, I worked with him. And, uh, and then uh, at a certain point, um, I was uh, 17 at the time, and um, I just chose to go live with my mom because I was like, you know, I, I, I'm just really curious. You know, there were a lot of things in my mind that, uh, you know, I didn't really know my mom like I think I should, mm -hmm. I should have. And um, so I wanted to know more about that side of my family. So I went and... Um, moved with my mom and she wanted me out of the projects. And so we moved down to uh, Florida, Daytona Beach. So my senior year of high school was in Daytona Beach, Florida. So it was a weird thing because um, my high school, the first year of high school, I went to art and design in Manhattan. So I had to take a bus, a boat, and a train to and from school every day. So I take the three bus down the ferry, take the stand on ferry across, take the four of the five up to uh, 57th and Lexington, go to school. And, uh, you know, I was always drawing and stuff like that. So um, I got into this art school. And I went there for a year, but it, it, it um, I didn't do well. I was coming in late and uh, it just wasn't a good fit. And I ended up leaving that school. And then I went to my zone school, uh, Susan Wagner for two years, so 10th and 11th. And then I went with my mom and uh, moved down to Daytona Beach and I went to Seabreeze Senior High School in Daytona Beach, so my that was my senior year. And when I was there, that's when I enlisted on the uh, delayed entry program mm -hmm. and got into uh, the Navy. Did you play any sports at any of these schools? No. Did you, it's weird how you had that it makes me think it runs deeper than I've even thought before. Like the idea of when you saw Rambo, you're like, you can identify with it. Even though you were a nerd playing Dungeons and Dragons and looking at spider books, you see Rambo, you're like, oh, okay, cool. That's what I'm going to do. That's well, a deep seated thing, man. I think looking back on it, James had a lot to do with it. Mark and James, because like getting beat up like that at a certain point you just like you know you've had enough and then you kind of I think in a sense can overcompensate so I, I started learning about um, martial arts another really big part of you know my story is uh, my oldest brother was um, you know we had a big family incident he was outside and a, and a, a guy and uh, there's West Bryan Projects and right near it is Markham Homes. It's another uh, pretty rough area. And my brother was there and um, this guy uh, stabbed him with a buck 007 knife. That's a big blade to the hilt. And, you know, his heart was, was beating, you know, moving the knife, you know, punctured his lung. And he was in the hospital for a while. And he got out. You know, uh, um, you know, doctors saved his life and all. He's got a really big scar on his chest, but I mean, I think he he got into kung fu from that, I would say, and um, you know, he went all the way to uh, being an instructor in that. But you know, he would show me, you know, occasion on on uh, weekends sometimes I would go with him and train in um, hungar kung fu, and um, I was never really, you know, I never really got good at it. But it did instill in me, you know, martial arts is something you want to learn. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I had those things going for me. And I think between learning a little bit about martial arts and, you know, the beatings I was taking at a certain point, I was like, you know, I can change it. 
if I want. So my thing was to become a SEAL. I thought that would be my answer. So that's where I went. So you, so you get to Florida. What was it like going to school in Florida? I mean, Sea Breeze, it's a high school. Sounds it sounds nice. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds nice. But what was it? I mean, was well, it nice or was it a yeah, dump or? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, it was uh, definitely more laid back than uh, being in New York. Uh, I remember distinctly at that time, Ted Bundy was in that area and. The chaplain at our school was, I think, associated with Ted Bundy. And I just remember he was getting the electric chair. And, and everyone in the school was like, make sure you keep all your electrical components low so they have enough juice to fry this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you talk to the, when you talk to the recruiter, uh, did, so you had to talk to a recruiter again in Florida, mm-hmm. right? You obviously had to change recruiter. What did the recruiter say to you? The recruiters were all about getting as many people in as possible. Like, you want to go sales? Right, come yeah. over here. And you look like I'd be a great candidate. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was surprised the first guy told you he didn't think you were going to make it. Although J.P. Donnell, they laughed Same at him. Thing. Yeah, They laughed at him. Maybe that's a good test. And Dakota Meyer, the guy said, to, from the Marine Corps, said, you, we don't have what it takes anyways. And yeah. Dakota Meyer signed up the next day <laughs> yeah. or whatever, right? That's a good, it's a little reverse psychology. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they told you, oh, yeah, you look like you'd be a great candidate for the SEAL teams. They're waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, we have the, the Die Fair program. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Die Fair program, I don't, they probably have something similar today, but you enlist for six years. And uh, if you make it through BUDS training and your uh, SEAL training, then you're on SEAL team. If you don't make it, you're still in the Navy for six years. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did the dive fair program too. And it's funny too because when you talk when it seemed like six years, it's well, that's like an eighth or a, sorry, a third of your life at the time, right? Because you're 18 years old and you're saying, I'm signing on this thing for six years. And you and me, I don't know about you, I'm pretty sure you're probably the same way. I had no idea whatsoever what the daily life of a SEAL was. I, as far as I'm concerned, it, I was like, well, it's got to be pretty similar to John J. Rambo, right? I mean, it's going to be something like that. We're going to be out just hunting people down and killing them. That's what's going to be happening. Six years, cool, sign me up. You have no idea what you're getting into, which is kind of cool because I pr- I can just about guarantee that anybody that had an I- that anybody that thought about what they were getting into, you thought it was going to be way more extreme than anything – Oh, that you yeah. could have, than, than it actually was. I, I mean, I remember the stories of, yeah, when you're in SEAL training, they bury you up up to your neck in the sand and let the tide come in and drown you. And then they resuscitate you and then ask you if you want to quit. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's the program that's I it. want. Sign me up. <laughs> you know what I remember is a guy that ended up, he was actually ended up in a class behind us, but I went through boot camp with him. And he was a smart guy, went to college, great guy. And uh, he's telling me, he goes, yeah, SEALs have 50% casualty rate. Like like no one makes it to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> this is 1991, bro. There's no, I mean, I guess the Gulf War is about to happen, but there hadn't been a war in a long time. And I think, I think it came originally from World War II when like at Normandy, yeah, the, the, the heavy, UDTs heavy, took yeah, heavy, ca- they took like a 50% casualty rate. But I thought that's just how. I thought I was going in, I'm signing up, and I'm going to get killed or or wounded, or, and I'm probably not going to make it to 20 years. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Same attitude. Oh, yeah, they, you definitely heard that they drowned you. You definitely heard that they drowned you. In training, you're going to get drowned. People are going <laughs> to drown you. That's what's going to happen. And you're like, yeah, that's what I want, which is pretty crazy, right? Yeah. It seems like even that's a good kind of screening process, an initial screening process. And the crazy thing is so many people still quit. That's what's crazy. You know what you're signing up for. You know what you're signing up for. At least you have some, you're signing up to die. I mean, I, I can tell you, I was signing up to die. I, like in my yeah. mind, I was like, okay, when I sign this paper, you know, my life is no longer, is no longer a promise. It's no longer even a thing. Yeah. You. I mean, you are an adult, even though a very young adult, but you understand what you're getting into. And, you know, the chances of getting killed or or hurt really badly or, you know, can happen. Anything else from childhood before we jump into, before we get the, the, uh, 
in the boot camp. No, <laughs> <laughs> mm, um, nothing of note on him at this point. You, so you finish up your senior. What kind of training are you doing, getting ready? Um, putting my backpack, and uh, sometimes I would run to school. Um, I'm doing a one incident. I got saved at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> So this, I, uh, it's this tropical storm coming in and I'm, you know, keep in mind, I'm coming from the projects in New York city. So swimming is not, I'm not a good swimmer. And, uh, I'm like, well, the best way to learn, you know, is to go tropical storm, swim. baby. <laughs> and I just remember getting out of getting out and, uh, looking at the beach and just seeing the water like frothy and stuff. And I was just like, let's go for it. And I just ran in and basically I was a drowning victim. And this guy came out, pulled me out of the water, started yelling at me and stuff like that. So then I came home and I'm like, you know, I, I told my mom, hey, I want to take swim lessons. So then uh, the only place we could find was the YWCA. And this, this uh, I, I think she was like a, um, maybe a college student. You know, I just would see this girl um, writing notes and stuff on the side of the textbook. But she was the guard there, and she taught me how to swim. So I learned uh, the side stroke, like basic side stroke, not a mm -hmm. combat swimmer stroke, uh, breast stroke, crawl, you know, like the technique of it. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing it, I, I, I got books on swimming workouts, how to swim, how to, you know, get um, more um, hydrodynamic, this kind of thing. How much swimming did you do in the projects? Not really any. I mean, like in the summer, there's a pool right near it. The pool is three feet. Mm -hmm. And then they have the little baby pool. So that was another thing about Mark and James. When, when, the, when I would go to the pool, I mean, I mean, on several occasions, I mean, James, if you're out there listening, you almost killed me a couple of times. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. He would. You know, there's like a ladder you could walk out. He would get me under there and stand on me and hold me there, like trying to drown me. And the worst feeling I ever had was like just, you know, I'm in the water and like I'm bouncing, like bobbing because it's too deep. And I just hear, you! <laughs> and I look over and I see him on the side. Jeffrey, I'm coming for you. And then he jump in and come after him. I'm trying to get out, you know, trying to hop away. And then I look over and then it's Mark. And then, you know, I would, you know, the lifeguards would, you know, have to get these guys away from me. So, yeah, I, did, I was not a, uh, the swimming extent was like, close your eyes, windmill until you can't hold your breath anymore and then stand. And hopefully there's a bottom to stand on. How did you... Uh Dude, how did you not get freaking discouraged after you almost drown and you don't know how to swim? And you must be at least seeing that the SEAL test is, what do we have to swim, 500 meters, 500 yards to like go to buds? Yeah. How did you not say, maybe I need to look at the Rangers or maybe I need to <laughs> look at the Special Forces or something? I was just really bent on the SEALs. And uh, that was just, um, that was the one back then, like now there's a lot of information on SEAL team. Mm -hmm. But back then, you couldn't find anything. Yeah. And, and I remember you. there were these books, like I'd get like the Ranger book, and then you'd open it up and you'd see like they had Green Berets, SEALs, Force Recon, and then you look like when you try to find the SEAL book, no one had it. And it was like the mystery. Mm -hmm. So I was like, ah, you know, I think I want to I wanna go with that one. So you, how long are you in the delayed entry program for? Let's see. Um, I graduated high school. Um, like that springtime, and I was in the Navy in August 15th. Okay, so it's pretty quick. Yeah, I went in pretty much right after high school. So that that um, I had like maybe a two-month period of really swimming. Mm -hmm. That's what I was working on. And, you know, I was doing push-ups and finding like the screening tests or so working on pull-ups and sit-ups, you know, all the basics you need for buds, running. Mm -hmm. Then you, you shipped off, did you go to boot camp in Orlando? Right, Orlando, yeah. How, was that a shock to your system? I think the main shock was just the first, like, wake up. But then after that, you know, I was pretty smooth. It wasn't really that big a deal. I was in a nuke um, 
uh, boot camp. Dang. Uh, so I was in the new boot camp, and it was like myself and this other guy's name was Justice. We were both going to the SEALs. And so we were like, yo, those are the SEAL guys, you know, over there. We'd, we'd you know, in boot camp, my swim was still not qualifying. So they were like, hey, you, if you're serious about this program, you get up at 3.30, go over there to the pool, and do your laps before, you know, the regular day of boot camp starts. So I was like, I did that uh, throughout boot camp and, and really improved my swimming. And there was a... Um, you know, they had SEAL motivators working there. Mm-hmm. And there was a SEAL Vietnam vet, you know, rough dude there. And uh, he was, uh, he would kind of, you know, oversee the swim. He would watch me and stuff. And he would be saying stuff like, <laughs> you'll never make it with that kind of stroke. You'll just <laughs> never make it. <laughs> and uh, I had I had an issue with him because, you know, I I I I had, um, my swim was like just on the edge. I failed, so I knew I could pass it. I just needed to be faster. Push ups were good, sit ups, but my pull ups were like on the edge too. Dang. And so I remember like getting. I got seven, and then I got eight. Was like right here, and uh, he just counted seven, and I tried again. And you know, like with pull ups, once yeah. you fail, you're <laughs> yeah. not going back up. <laughs> And I just stayed on the bar, and he said, all right, recruit, jump off the bar. And I, I yelled out, SEALs don't quit. <laughs> <laughs> and he just he just laid into me, screaming and stuff. So I jumped off the bar, and then I, uh, I knew I had to work on the pull-ups. So they had a gym there. And what I did was— um, So that was during boot camp all this happened? Yeah. I don't even remember me taking a screening test one time. Yeah, I took it— well, I think like two, two or three times. So then the, the um, because if you don't make it for buds, you know, there was, you kind of, okay, now you can go diver mm-hmm. or EOD. Mm-hmm. So um, I ended up working on a pull-down machine, and that's how I got my pull-ups. So then by, actually, actually by, the, by the end of boot camp, I passed the tests and um, ended up, you know, with orders. So then you get to Buds. Do you remember checking into Buds? Yeah, that's another thing. So when I was in boot camp and uh, I get to, you have, back then you had to go through your source rating. So I was an engineman. So I had to go to Great Lakes and go through engineman A school. Mm-hmm. This is like the trade that you're going to get. If you don't make it through SEAL training, you're going to work in this job in the regular Navy. And so I went um, to Great Lakes and went through ENA school. And uh, my vision didn't qualify for BUDS. Dang. So this is kind of like going to maybe put me in hot water with some people. But essentially, I ended up passing the vision test through um, some nefarious methods. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you do it? So essentially what happened was I had orders to um, EOD training. Because your vision wasn't good enough? Right, for butts. So everything else was good enough, but my vision, you know, I, you know, glasses. So uh, one of the one of the guys there that worked in, one of the dive motivators, Steve Collins, uh, that another really pivotal person in my life he was like hey man if you really interested in going the seal training you know we can um work on switching your orders and uh you'll have to work as a you know for us as you know the dive motivator shack i was like yeah of course and so i did it and i had to wait like it was like months like i'm gonna say like at least six months Dang. and i worked for these um dive motivators just study, George, studying yeah, for your vision test <laughs> and here's the deal they had the medical was right near it and the vision test that i have to take is right there on the wall so every day i'm just looking at it and memorizing all of the you know the letters and numbers mm-hmm. and um i ended up passing the test <laughs> So you, that's awesome. 
And and this whole time you're obviously working out and getting in shape, and these guys are telling you and, what to do and what to be prepared for and all that stuff. Yeah, that was another big deal. Like George White, Steve Collins, um, uh, Instructor Roberts. These guys really made a difference because they were like, hey, you know, they weren't like, you know, showing me everything, but they were like, you have to do this. This is going to help you. You need to run. You need to do this and that. And what was really bad was at a certain point, you know, team guys working at the dive motivator shack, they don't want to do it. And so they're like, Higgs, here's a blue and gold, some UDD, UDT trunks. So I'm looking like a seal, right? I got the blue and gold UDD trunks and the, the um, boots on and everything and the dive socks. And they're like, you're going to give the test. Dang. So for six months... I'm working at the dive motivators and they're pretending like, to be a seal. I, yeah, yeah, pretty much. They're like, "Hey, you know, um, Higgs, what's what's it like at Seal Team?" And I'm like, "Let's not talk about that." Right now. <laughs> what you have to worry about is getting through the screening test. So I would, I would run the. They would do the runs. They would do the, the push-ups. All the stuff. I would test them and just record it. And uh, six months of that, and then when I get the buds, you got like dozens and dozens of guys who are like, hey, that's the, the dive motivator guy. <laughs> I'm just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're checking the buds. I don't, yeah. you know what's weird is I don't really remember. You know how some people have really good checking into bud stories or whatever, like they check in and they get immediately told to hit the surf and they're dressed whites or whatever. Uh, for whatever reason, man, I don't really even remember checking into buds. I think it was a weekend. I think no one cared, you know, and I, I was the biggest thing for me is I was kind of surprised. You know, I expected to walk through the quarter deck and just get ripped apart and start becoming a different, you know, you know, like the, the James Bond movie, Echo Charles, you know, where the door opens and there's people training and they're doing judo and they're shooting guns. And, like, I, th- I thought that was what was happening. <laughs> But instead, I open up the door, and there's like two new, two other guys that are going through training, and they're sitting there all scared, looking, and there's no one around. And I said, "I'm checking into buds," and they're like, "Okay, uh, you can just sign this, and then you come back on Monday." And I was kind of let down. It was very uh, anticlimactic. Some people get a much better. Did you? Was anything cool for you? Uh, yeah, I think um, I showed up on the quarter deck, and uh, someone was getting hammered there because I showed up during the day, oh, during yeah. the weekday, and guys were getting hammered and yelled at. And instructors just look at me and like, you know here? And I'm like, yes, yes. And they're just like, good, we'll be seeing you. You know, and just walk <laughs> off, you know. And I'm like, already like, oh. <laughs> so then how long did it take for you to class up? Uh, it was I went through, I don't know if they do this these days, but they had the fourth phase. So mm-hmm. I was in fourth phase. And you just wait there until you class up. So I originally classed up with Bud's class 174. How far did you make it in 174? All the way to the day before Hell Week. And then what happened? So you have like uh, basically um, you're going through first phase, like the conditioning phase of BUDS, doing lots of long runs, swims, PTs, O course, all that stuff. And um, I ended up doing this one swim like uh, a week before that last week. And on the swim, my my uh, my face mask one of the one of the lenses fell out, and I just the water was it was a super choppy swim. So every every stroke I'm like taking on water, and then I have no you know it's I can't really see much, and it's making me go slower for my swim buddy and everything, and I just felt sick on the swim, like nauseated and really weak and tired, like not normal. And uh, when I got out of the water, you know, we just got hammered because we failed to swim. And then I had to go in and, you know, uh, do a, um, <laughs> you're just getting hammered. Mm-hmm. And so it was, uh, that was like on a Thursday. It's in the weekend. And then um, Tuesday comes along and then we got to do the two mile swims, uh, ocean swim. And then on that swim, I, uh, coming back, past the swim but when I came out of the water I couldn't stand I was just falling and I was crawling and I would stand up and fall over again and the instructors just swarmed on me and just started trying to hammer me and I'm trying to do 
push-ups or whatever, but I just couldn't. And then, then I start laughing like it was funny. That was like my first experience of being inebriated because I was basically, you know, find out later I had hypothermia. So I got, I had a 91 degree core temperature at that point. <clears throat> and, um, dang. So they brought me, you know, uh, to uh, the hypothermia chamber. And uh, that's basically a hot tub and get my um, body temperature back up. And uh, then it's like, you know, you feeling better? Yeah. All right, this is SEAL training. So go get wet and sandy. You know, right after I'm coming back to normal. And then they're like, um, that night I just remember, you know, mine in the rack and thinking like, you know, I'm, medically, I'm having some issues here. And how am I going to get through? There's another swim, and then they just get longer. You know, so um, I just remember tossing and turning, and then the, the everyone in the class was, like, trying to help me out. So, like, you know, back then you got to take panathenic acid pills, like this B vitamin that's supposed to increase thermogenesis and make your body heat up. And so, uh, and then you need lots of calories, so what we did on this one swim before it, everyone came in, put Vaseline all over, then my wetsuit, and then drink a bottle of olive oil for calories to help burn mm -hmm. during the swim. And, well, that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite finish the bottle of olive oil, but I can tell you right now it's not a good idea. So um, when, you know, we're doing swim inspection and the instructor's are, you know, checking knives, CO2 cartridges, and the instructor looks, and they see the Vaseline on the end of the sleeve. I'm like, what is this? And he pulls it up, and he sees the Vaseline. He's like, take your wetsuit off, and then roll around in the sand, and then put the wetsuit back on, and then do the swim. And so... Uh, I did so it's like this this two mile ocean swim just like every you know at a certain point it's just the sand is just destroying your skin and everything and um this is seal training yeah so uh, I came out and I had hypothermia again and uh you know at this time it was a lot different because I was like you know I was like I, my body's not working the way I want it to you know it's I'm not quitting it's like I don't even have control of the situation and uh, essentially, uh, at that point, they're like, you know, hey, you, you can't continue in the training. You're going to get killed. You know, they had a, someone a few classes ahead who had died out in San Clemente. You know, he did a swim, a four-mile ocean swim, came out of the water and just fell down, and, and you know, he didn't make it. So, like, you know, and this guy's his body temperature was only a few degrees below mine. So, um they were like, you know, you're medically dropped from training. And so I was, uh, that was a, on that Friday, then the hell week starts for that class I was in that Sunday. And I just remember being in my room, like, with the lights off and, like, you know, feeling of crying, you know. I was like <laughs> <laughs> and all the class was going through hell week, and I just, I wasn't allowed in. And, uh, you know, there were some, you know, when I, when I was, um, medically dropped I just started to do my own training because I was you know now I'm in X division so I got the the navy garb on the white hat the dunga G, dunga jams dungaree clothing and uh, doing watch and one of the instructors came by and said hey I always I, I knew you'd quit sooner or later and I was like I didn't quit it's like yeah you did and then walked off and that just like got me angry so I was like I'm gonna do my own training so I started doing, I would join the class and run behind them. You know, I was just being a part of the class, doing cadence and everything. And uh, I went and got wet and sandy. And then uh, Instructor Dumas, you remember him? Yeah. He just pulled me aside and it was like, it's over, son. It's over. Dang. And, and that was it. And so I had orders to some uh, ship in like Louisiana or something like that. And, uh, but the instructors that saw me getting wet and sandy, they were like, oh, look at this kid, you know. And uh, there was an instructor named Chief Small. And he said, if you want 
you write a request uh, for captain's mast, and I'll try to get you in training. I'll put in a good word for you and get you back into training. And I was like, yeah. And so I would write the request, but now I'm in X Division, so I'm working for that guy, Boward. Mm-hmm. And this is an old Vietnam vet rough guy. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to, for me to do justice with this guy. You know what this guy was like. And he would just take my request and throw it in the garbage. And he just kept doing it. And he would just, just yell at me, you'll never make it through this program, son. Get the hell out of here. And uh, the guy, Chief Small, I told him about it. He took it up to the CO and um, I got Captain's Mast. And um, Lieutenant Zinke was, I think, part of that. And uh, those guys, they said, hey, we're going to give you another chance. Because I was explaining, you know, I didn't quit the training. I got medically dropped. I'm like, hey, if you can gain weight, because I'm like, at that point, I'm, I'm 6'1", but I weighed, I've looked at my medical record, I weighed like 153. And, you know, that's just not enough mass to get you through the cold of being a frogman. It's just not going to, it's going to be tough. So uh, they, they're like, hey, it was Christmas time, Merry Christmas, you're back in training, go get wet. And uh, I started up in uh, class 176 like a couple months later. So that that time I was... Um, that in between time of classing up, I just focused on gaining weight. So I would, uh, which is really strange for a lot of people. You can order pizza mm-hmm. in butts, <laughs> like when everything's over, you can order pizza in butts. And and so I would, I was like, you know, I have to gain weight. So, you know, on some time off, I got a big thing of that weight gain powder. <laughs> I got a bunch of milk like whole milk, and uh, I would order two-for-one Domino's pizza. Mm -hmm. And I was just constantly drinking the milk with the weight gain. I would eat a pizza before I went to sleep with the weight gain and the milk, set my clock for 3 in the morning, and eat the other pizza. You know, and it it got disgusting now (laughs) at at a certain point. Like, I'm I'm not a pizza fan anymore. (laughs) But I ended up, by the time I classed up, I was like – like 170 you know i'd gained weight dang and uh i i um then i classed up in buds class 176 and then in, came to more difficulties with pool comp and then i got rolled into 177 your class and i wasn't even pool comp it was it was um uh, uh like dive buddy because i was with, oh like um, buddy breathing or something yeah i was with matt oh okay did both you guys get rolled for that? Yeah. Two so you didn't, sandwiches. <laughs> so so you you didn't get rolled into our class until that was second in phase? Die, yeah, die phase. So I went through Hell Week in 176. And the hardest you, Hell Week that, that ever really existed in Buds. That's, that's <laughs> a, seven, six guys know this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so then you rolled into our class and uh, yeah. The, no one really told no there was no heads up whatsoever about like the pool comp and all that stuff that's something no one really knows about it, they know about it now but back then they had that texas chainsaw massacre poster in the medical area and it said but it was crossed out it's, it's crossed out uh texas it said bud's pool comp massacre and it had like a mask on one of the guys that was getting his head sawn off with a chainsaw and that's what pool comp is you know, yeah. you're going to go down there and you're going to get annihilated. I tell you, I mean, it's it's really hard to do it justice. Like, basically, it's not a matter of pain. It's a matter of dealing with not being able to breathe. Like, if and, and you're on compressed air. If you hold your breath and rock it to the surface, you're going to embolize and hurt yourself badly. <laughs> you know, so you have to have that control. And the instructors are taking your mask off, tying your your gear and knots and you have to get these knots out i mean the other thing is um they're using the old regulators Mm -hmm. from the 50s like jacques still so you can close it and you can't breathe so they they're taking this regulator out and it's filled with water and then you gotta you gotta turn your head to get the water out or blow it out Mm -hmm. and they're tying these see these knots in and you have to get it out it's just it's horrific and it lasts a long time yeah it's 30 minutes your first breath is water 
So, so because when they rip that regulator out of your mouth, the hose fills with water. So when you put it in your mouth, you can't just no. Well, your first breath is, yeah. and you gotta like absorb the water and get it out, and then you get a breath. So you're you're in full panic mode as you're trying to get the knot untied. You finally get it untied, and now you're just just dying for air. And you put that thing in your mouth, and you still have to clear that thing. It's it's really uh, it's where I failed. I failed pool comp my first time, and then uh, I don't know. Were you with us in the dip tank? Because over the weekend, myself and a few other guys that failed. Did you pass it the first time when you went through with one seven seven? Did no. you pass pool comp? No, I did not. <laughs> oh no, brother! <laughs> and what happened with? Do uh, uh, you remember uh, Ensign Davies? Yeah, we got out on that weekend because you know we had failed we were on the wall of shame and uh we went down to mexico to do dive training yeah and we we were like i rem- what was so weird was you know in mexico the the beach had all this uh life on it that you don't see here you know but it's essentially the same beach just further down but uh yeah we did a we kind of like worked on it ourselves uh-huh. for a bit and then uh came back and I just remember that that Sunday night thinking of everyone's just tossing and turning in their bed because you're like am I gonna make it through this the next day you know and uh I was able to uh you know I did it yeah yeah we what we did and I, I'm not sure how you weren't with us but it was me and like three or four other guys that failed pool comp on Friday and we went in the big dip tank and we straight up drowned each other. We were just murdering each other in there and clearing stuff and man, I was so horrified of not making it and of getting rolled. You know, cause I, I didn't even think about getting rolled. It's like, as far as I was concerned, if I got rolled, that, that seemed like just death. You know, it seemed like the worst thing ever. But we pool comped each other so hard that all of us made it the first time on Monday morning. Like it was no factor. So that extra little bit of training, whether in Mexico or whether in the dip tank, I, can, I also, they let us do it. Like the instructors, I don't know how we did it. I don't know what happened that we had all the gear. Like we got full scuba tanks with air and brought them into the dip tank and just murdered each other. Mm-hmm. I don't know, that's not legal. You know, like that's not okay, you can't do that. That's <laughs> like the, if you, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Yeah. They're just like, there's an opening right there if you take the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Good on you. If you don't, so sorry. So sorry. <sighs> yeah, so uh, we end up, you end up in our class. That's funny. I actually thought you did everything with us. I thought I thought you got rolled into 177. I thought you went through Hell Week with us. I didn't remember that. I didn't remember that you got rolled in in, in uh, dive phase. Because, yeah, so then we did San Clemente Island, mm-hmm. chewing tobacco. Yeah, that's... Not a fond memory. <laughs> <laughs> they found, guys, you're not allowed to have chewing tobacco out there. And they found somebody had smuggled a bunch out. A bunch. Mm-hmm. And so they made everyone in the class take massive um, chunks of chewing tobacco. And then yeah. we did like a thousand eight count bodybuilders, which is like an old school burpee. And uh, like me, I, didn't, I never chewed tobacco and <laughs> never <laughs> smoked a cigarette. And, and all of a sudden I got a big mouthful of this. Yeah, I, I I haven't dipped since. That was my one and only. Time. Yeah, that was your opportunity. <laughs> does it like jam you? Like when you dip and you haven't ever? Does it like you feel like actual effects? Right, like way stronger. Yeah, way, like it jams you up kind of hard. The dip. Yeah, that stuff makes you feel sick. Yeah, it made me feel sick. Nauseated. It made me and, feel sick. Yeah, and burning in my mouth. Yeah. Yeah, but you know how like okay, let's say you never smoked a cigarette ever, and then you straight up smoke a whole cigarette. You're gonna be like buzzing, kind of hardcore, right? Were you buzzing from the dip? Is what I'm saying. I didn't notice any I didn't of that. I just <laughs> <laughs> I felt eight count bodybuilders <laughs> and pain, and just thinking yeah. like this is horrible. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like like you said, Jeff, it cured me of ever wanting to do that. Mm. And so, you, well, I think it's important to know, like you know, in spec ops, a lot of guys are gonna use dip chewing tobacco because of that reason. It's like a little bit of a, uh, you know, like caffeine in a sense. Yeah, it's yeah. an upper. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? Anything else from San Clemente Island? Mm. Besides good times and flights? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on fire. Requested to do a touch and go. 
Yeah, do they still do that? Like they the, still uh, do frog, flights. Frog Hill. They still stuff? do Frog Hill. They still do flights. They still got a flight tower out there. You still do touch and goes the whole nine yards. Yeah, it's good times. Make you tough. So then you get the, we got done with buds. You check in a SEAL team, and uh, so what? It's 1991 when we get to SEAL Team One. Yeah, it's early 1991. Did we go to Did we go to airborne school together? Yeah, went to get our airborne on. Fort Benning. Yeah. So that's different too nowadays. But back then you went to Army Jump School, yep. Fort Benning, Georgia. And that's where SEALs get like a horrible, I guess kind of a horrible reputation because like you're coming out of BUDS back in the day. You'd go to airborne school, which airborne is a very conventional school to go to like everyone, like a lot, not everyone, but a lot of people go to the go to the Army Jump School. So there's no super high standard for physicality or anything. So when you get down, you're fresh out of SEAL training. And you're down there just feeling like you can do anything. And, of course, the the, the black hats, which are the instructors down there, they, 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 you know what they call everyone? Navy. If they call every guy that's not in the Army, they just call you Navy. And they'll be like, come on over here, Navy. <laughs> beat your boots. That was another thing. To make you do squats, they say beat your boots. And you basically got to hit your boots. Uh, but it's pretty fun school. I had a good time. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, airborne was cool. And then, um, and then we check into SEAL Team One, and you end. Well, we went through SQT together, or STT it used to be called mm -hmm. SEAL Tactical Training. Yes, that was just learning all the stuff that you actually. Well, I wanted to actually learn. I'm sure we all just wanted to learn how to shoot, move, and communicate, how to patrol, mm -hmm. explosives. Like this is when you start doing cooler stuff besides being wet and sandy. Yes. And then from there we roll into our platoons. You're in my sister platoon. We call it brother platoon. Okay, fair enough. I wonder why they call it sister platoon. They do. They never call yeah. it brother platoon. Mm. I mean, like stores, they'll do that too. Oh, That's our sister store. Yeah, you know, like you we never say moms. brother store. Even in the teams where there's no females, mm. we say brother. <laughs> What's up with that? I mean, we say sister. So you guys are in our brother platoon apparently now. Or sister platoon. <laughs> And uh, we're doing work up, you know, it's a different environment. I remember your platoon, your platoon had some, let's just say, pipe hitters in it, right? I mean, you guys had some heavy hitters in that platoon. Yeah. <laughs> More so than in my first platoon. We had great guys in my first platoon, but the guys that you had in your platoon were harder. Straight up. There's no real other way of putting it. They were harder on you guys for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm lucky in the sense that uh, I wasn't the main target. <laughs> I mean, I was targeted. I mean, there was a situation we had down in um, in Panama, like with the hazing, that was really extreme. Yeah, you know, and and um, you know, some some injuries happened. I got choked out at least five times that night, at least. Yeah. And uh, yeah, beaten. You know, it's it, it was that platoon was pretty hardcore. Yeah, I've told a story on this podcast a couple times about like when I got to the team and I'm I'm sitting out by the pull or I'm out doing a workout on the pull-up bar and this giant human, like barely human, goes lumbering out across the. It's probably two hundred, maybe even a hundred yards from like the team area to first lieutenant where the engines are, mm -hmm. and it's a guy from your platoon. You know who it is, the biggest guy in your platoon. Yeah, and he's carrying a gallon of milk with him, and so he's lumbering across this giant guy with his whole body tattooed, no shirt on, and he stops like at the fifty meter mark, and drinks a half a gallon of milk, <laughs> <laughs> and then he puts it down, and then he keeps walking, and I'm like, how am I going to survive in this environment? <laughs> Because it was just, it was a very hostile environment back then. You know, very hostile in, in the SEAL platoons. And and you know what? A lot, not a lot of it, so let's just say some of it was wrong. Some of it, like some of it got taken to a point where it was not good for morale. It wasn't good for unity. You know, some of the hazing got to a point where you're like, hey, that that's not, that's not okay. Like that's wrong. Some of it's good, you know, some of it's okay, you know, welcome to the teams and it's a rough environment. If you screw up, you're gonna pay. But yeah, some of it went overboard. But yeah, you had a you had a you had a hardcore platoon. 
And when we uh, when we got overseas, we were, you know, what I remember is an old an old Master Chief who seemed like the oldest guy I'd ever seen in my life, which was Steve Bailey, you know, and he was probably like seven years younger or eight years younger than I am right now. He's probably like 40, but he seems so old. And he's like, does anyone here want to learn how to fight? And I'm like, yep, me. And I, I guess, I don't know if we were together when that happened, but we ended up in the Kwanzaa hut with mats on the ground and he knew enough jujitsu. He was like a white belt. No, I, I, my uh, recollection is different. So the first deployment overseas, that platoon that mm-hmm. we were just talking about, we went to Guam mm-hmm. and then flew straight to Thailand. Okay. And we were in Thailand and that's where I met Steve we were okay. talking about. And basically uh, I got introduced to jujitsu there and then when we got back to Guam, you know, continue the training. Uh, okay. So it's kind of weird. 1991 mm-hmm. and I got introduced to jujitsu Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Thailand yeah. in ninety one and then uh actually that's ninety two, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then um uh coming back to um Guam started at the Quonsidut. Yeah, so so that must have happened because uh, you went right away to Thailand. Yeah. I'm in, still in Guam. You everyone comes back from Thailand, including Steve Bailey. And then when he came back he must have said, Hey, who wants to learn jujitsu? I raised my hand, you know, he I think he he's who wants to learn how to fight? Because I don't, I think him asking who wants to learn jujitsu would have been the most, you, you know, would have been like, oh, is this a language? Is this a, I wouldn't even know. So it was more like, hey, who wants to learn how to fight? I'm like, of course. And then I just remember him just choking us out. I mean, and everything just like with three or four different moves. You know, it was like, oh, he knew a, maybe an arm lock, an Americana, maybe like the sit-up sweep. He didn't, there wasn't a ton of different things. Like he knew how to take the back, but it wasn't this, it seemed like a lit limited number of moves that jujitsu was. It wasn't as evolved as it as it is now, for sure. Were you no, already making man. the connection? I didn't even make the connection. I thought, oh, there's in my mind. I thought jujitsu was seven moves, like I, you know, or whatever. Maybe when you get advanced, there's twelve. You know what I mean? I just thought, okay, there's seven moves. Here they are. Practice them, and then you know jujitsu. I didn't. I didn't make the connection between that what we were learning and this whole freaking crazy uh, sport. Uh, Well, my training with Steve was a really pivotal time in my life. You know, um, he uh, introduced me to jujitsu. That's really changed my life in in a really awesome way. But also like, um, it was a lot of striking Mm -hmm. too. We did a kickboxing, and um, you know, I, I uh, that's what actually solidified my um, my journey in jujitsu because you know he had a few black belts that had trained under him, other team guys, and uh, we would do we were doing sparring at this point when we'd come back home, and uh, I would go down there and like for two years at least, I trained three times a week there, and it was one day striking and then the next day we do ground and uh i got and then like on a friday we do like just sparring and so it's like seal team and all the other guys are black belts and i'm like the new guy and it's just like the goal is to knock the new guy out you know and and um i got my jaw dislocated by one of the guys i came in on him and he turned around and spin hook kick right in my chin and uh i fell forward he turned his back no hooks or nothing I just put the choke on and I choked him but then after that I couldn't remember what day it was my my back teeth weren't touching and uh, my 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 chin was just swollen and I had to like wait around for a while so I had like the wherewithal to get back home but that was like kind of like pivotal because I was like you know even when I was hurt the jujitsu goes on feel Mm-hmm. And sometimes when you don't have your senses, if you can just feel what's going on, you you have a chance. Mm-hmm. And so that was a big lesson for me. And that's after we got home. Right. So after we got home, you were stay you were staying engaged in jujitsu. When I got home, I didn't. And I think part of it's because I just thought, like I said, I thought, well, I know the seven moves of jujitsu, so I'm good. And I was in another platoon, 
And so I'm just like, okay, cool. I know jujitsu. In my mind, I actually thought I knew jujitsu. Like I'm good. I know I know everything. You know, like it's like I know the alphabet, right? Mm-hmm. I know these words, so I'm good. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but you kept training. At what yes. point did you find Fabio? All right. So we were, it had been. Um, I was getting out at that time. Okay. So. We do. We both do another platoon. Right. I'm in an ARG platoon, so I'm on a ship. You go back on a spec ops deployment to Guam. Did you go to Guam? Mm-hmm. So you go to Guam, and you're training that whole time? Yes. And then you come home. Continue the training. Yeah. And at that point, I was like, hey, you know, um, do they have, like, any kind of, uh, you know, like, any other places I can train? You know, I want to learn more, and I'm thinking about, you know, getting out. And uh, he's like, well, you know, Steve was like, you know, you should um, maybe check out a tournament. And I'm like, all right, yeah, okay. And I was the same way. And I'm thinking, you know, at this point, you know, I know (laughs) jujitsu. And um, he wrote a letter to me. He wrote a letter, sealed it. And he said, when you uh, get up there at the tournament, give this letter to Hoist. And I went up there and um, I met Hoist and gave him the letter he opened it and he said well you've been training with steve for two years you're a blue belt now and so i got my blue belt from hoist gracie i never had trained with him at all but got my blue belt there to do the tournament because like two years you know Mm -hmm. go in the blue belt division but i had never trained with the gi like when i got there i was like you know everyone had gis on i was like we had always done no gi Mm -hmm. and my first opponent was craig cole Fabio's Dang. first black belt down here. And I think it was maybe the worst. Uh, it might have been a record for the worst <laughs> loss in jiu-jitsu because <laughs> I didn't get tapped out, but it was like I had just never been swept that many times because he had the gi and I'd never seen those sweeps because yeah. yeah. I was always going no gi. And, and it was like literally like 30 nothing. Like <laughs> just I was just getting thrown around. And then I remember back then my, my defense for arm lock when the, someone gets mounted was to put your arm up and when they go for it, yank your elbow yeah. down as fast as possible. And uh, he almost caught me with the <laughs> arm out. But when I'm, I'm trying to get my arm out and then all of the friends were on the side like yelling, break it. And I ended Old up school getting, jujitsu. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> break it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, Probably I, I, including I, Fabio if he was there on the side. Fabio was refing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Check. That's going to work out good. <laughs> so then after that, um, you know, I was like, hey, you know, is there, they're like, hey, Fabio Santos is opening a school down in San Diego. And uh, that's where you can train if you want to go down and train under our system. So I was like, yeah, you know, I would definitely explore it. And, um, you know, and I went back, I told Steve what happened. And he was like, you know, well, you know, expand your horizons, learn as much as you can. And so I started uh, with Fabio, and I would train at Steve's. And then at a certain point, I'd um, I'd uh, gotten out at this point, and um, I'm now getting ready to go into school. So I had the GI Bill, and I'm I started working at uh, well, Mesa College, like a j- local junior college. What is it like, 1995? So. Yes. And so 90, I started at Fabio's in '95 during springtime. Okay. So I was like very, very early at Fabio's. Like uh, those, those are some good times too. Yeah, and then and then when you got out, what was your plan when you got out? I didn't really have a plan. You know, I was just like, um, I mean, realize coming from where I where I did, I haven't really seen much. I mean, yeah, I've been in the teams, but I mean, like, I haven't even like, I didn't even go to school or anything after. You know, I went in right after high school. So I was like really curious about just exploring. So I was like, go to school, I'm gonna try anything I can, you know, just looking at the world, seeing what everything's about. You know, um, I think uh, people who do come from areas like the projects, in a sense, you're kind of sequestered and you're not maybe seeing the big picture of things. And I will say, that's something for everyone. You know, you're, you're in your environment, and no one ever sees the whole picture. Maybe we see most of the picture, mm-hmm. but not the whole thing. 
And so I think um, at that point I wanted to just kind of explore life. And that my, my plan was if I don't like it, I can go back in the SEAL yeah. teams. So so then you, how, many, how many hours a day were you training jiu-jitsu when you got out? Well, uh, what I did was I wanted a way to, to be able to train a lot. So um, I ended up uh, working at Fabio's, essentially, you know, like cleaning the mats, doing the intro class, running the students around, you know, the morning and the night class. So I was just there at all the open hours, along with my uh, roommate, John. And uh, we basically were like Fabio's uh, assistants there. Right, right. Now, at some point, uh, I, I guess it was in late 95 or early 96 you came to my house you came to my house and said hey bro you want to you want to you want to go train and i was like <laughs> yeah i was like of course so we go across the street to the gra- to the to the um, park across the street from my house in coronado from my apartment in coronado we go down there and do you just you just you know, you're like, let's roll. And so, you know, I attacked you or whatever, and you were just triangle, arm lock, you know, whatever, choke, back. You just annihilated me, annihilated me. And it's actually, it's crazy, right? It's like you had gotten so good. And I just remember saying, all right, give me the address of this place. I'll be down there. Is it open today? Because I'll go down there today if it's open today. And if it's not open today, then I'll be down there tomorrow. And... um I went down there and I, I said, uh, I remember talking to Fabio's wife and I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm here and I wanna sign up for um, unlimited classes. And she's like, well, do you wanna try it first? And I'm like, nope, I just wanna sign up for unlimited classes. And she's like, okay, so that was that. Mm-hmm. And then we, then then it was on with the old, scru- the old school crew at Fabio's, which was a beast crew. Yeah. You, Dean Lister, uh, Craig, Craig Cole, James Nielsen, mm-hmm. right? Some beasts in there. Greg Mack ended up showing up along the way. Along the way, who else? Doctor Mick. Brent was there too. Brent was there. Um, remember Kim? Yep. I see Kim at wrestling tournaments sometimes. Mm-hmm. He he's a referee at wrist wrestling tournaments. Louis 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 Louis, the Korean dude from. Uh, oh, Louis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was he was because he was a judo guy originally. Mm-hmm. Bro, he used to go hard. Yeah, especially like early when he showed up, he would he would go hard. He was there to he was there to win <laughs> every well, time. It's, it's you know I look at that now in hindsight. You know, having have some had some judo experience as well. Judo the the um the way people attack is um I would say they're trying to make you tap. Yeah, they're not looking for you to tap. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've even traveled in certain areas in Asia. You can, no one taps to chokes. It's just, oh, you caught me in a choke, I'm going out. They're just not going to tap to a choke. So uh, I think the judo guys, um, anyone who's a judoka, when they get they go for their taps, like if you stand up in the guard and the guy has your arm, they're going to try to break it so that if the fight does continue, now you have one arm. Mm-hmm. So if you don't tap, they're still going to win because you have one arm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> At what point, and I think Fabio used to say this, he used to say, you're the only person, Jeff, that went from jujitsu to capoeira. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, when did you start getting into capoeira? Uh, that was like maybe uh, uh, a year after I got out. And essentially, it's the, just like I've been saying, I want to explore and try different things. You know, I've never been the type of person that, okay, don't do this. I'm like, well, why not? You know, so I was experimenting and I was, I was like, it's a good way to get good condition for jujitsu, you know, and learn something different. Mm-hmm. And that, that's another thing I remember is when you came to my house to fight me, uh, I was like, like what, how would you, uh, you know, if, you, if we were going to fight, how would you, <laughs> what would you do? Like, how would you start it? And you did some weird Capoeira stuff. Yeah, I started doing cuff. <laughs> yeah, and I was all confused. And I'm like, oh man, I don't even know what's happening. This is horrible. And then I'm in a triangle tapping out. Uh, and we were competing a lot back then. Like every opportunity we would get, we would go and compete. And one of the most, well, it's, it might be, it's definitely in the top probably five 
that I've been at live matches was we were at neutral grounds. Oh yeah, yeah which yeah. was in the ghetto in in like Inglewood or something. I mean, it is in a nasty part of L.A. and it was uh, it was like in the backyard of some crappy you know house, and they had a cage there. And there's freaking rabid pit bulls in the alley and everything. <laughs> and we roll in there and um, I, like we all had matches. And they set up, it wasn't a tournament, it was just like one match. And uh, God, think about those matches. There was, so you had a, well Dean had a match against the, um, the Armenian dude that was like a grown man. And he, I thought Dean, I thought he like, I thought the guy died of exhaustion or something in the ring. I don't know if you remember that one. It was mayhem. And the Armenian guys are cranking the Armenian music on boom boxes and stuff. It was it was so crazy. It was nuts, dude. And the cool thing is that's like the Carl Parisian crew. Like that's yeah. them. So like when Carl Parisian was like, oh yeah, dude, is one of like the old school guys. Uh, they had that, that, and they were all kind of linked to Judo Jean LaBelle. So it was just like really cool to be a part of that. But you had a match at neutral grounds back in the day against uh, Bo Hirschberger, who was this, he was he was like Hickson's, as far as I know, he was kind of Hickson's premier purple belt at the time. And at this time, like purple belt was kind of, oh, yeah. yeah, if you were, like purple belt was the highest level that Americans had at this point, right? And so you had this match against, um, Against that guy and he was a great guy. I mean, he's a great competitor. He competed all the time We'd see him all the time, but you but he was a lot bigger than you A lot bigger than you. You know, he was probably like what do you think 200 220 or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. Big guy and you guys threw down in a jiu-jitsu match and uh, You know, he was kind of on top and kind of as far as I can remember sort of dominating the match and then there came the triangle out of nowhere, and um, that was kind of nuts, man. Mm-hmm. You won that. Is there a video of that anywhere? Uh, no video. I have a, maybe a couple of pictures of it, you know, with competition. You know, I, I look at the uh, <laughs> competitions are, are um, I think it's really good to test your skill against um, other people in competition. Basically, you're looking at someone who has the same skill level but you don't know their game. Mm-hmm. And it's up to you to try to negotiate and you, and have your jiu-jitsu win in this situation. So, I, you know, the tournaments are good, I think. But, um, you know, I've because of Steve, because of where I grew up, my focus as far as jiu-jitsu is self-defense. Mm-hmm. That's my main focus. You know, I look at the matches like, this person won today, but then if they repeat the match, what happens then? And repeat it again and again and again. That's how you find out who's the who's the best. You you found out who's the best right there. You know, so I I, I kind of I want to keep my uh, you know, my humility. Mm-hmm. I guess I would say as far as like uh, fighting is concerned, anyone can lose at any time. So, you know, uh, make sure your technique's on point and be aware. Yeah, that's a weird thing too is it, it's it's a cool thing about jiu-jitsu is like you can go so hard You can go as hard as you can, you know, like that's the way jiu-jitsu works But then there's the other thing is it's as close as it is to a fight. It's not even a real fight It's still not a real fight and then what do you have in those other arenas? Mm-hmm. What can you do? What can you what, how can you what can you create really is what it boils down to there's a creativity aspect Mm-hmm. That's another thing that you kind of excel at with jiu-jitsu is, a, is the creative aspect of m- kind of creating moves and creating series that work really well together. How much, how about, um, you went to, like, I remember, you know, when I would see you, because eventually, uh, you know, we weren't all training at Fabio's anymore and we were training at different places. And so when I'd see you, it would always be, like you'd be deep into yoga or you'd be deep into kettlebells or you'd be deep into Bulgarian bag or you'd be deep into Sambo. You were always going down these different paths to add to your to add to your repertoire of moves and movement and strength and conditioning. Yes. Is that just still something that you're always doing? Yes. I mean, uh one thing that happened very pivotal thing, you know, when I was in school, the thing I focused on first was trying to get some type of work 
So they had the uh, San Diego Community College Fit and Specialist. So I, they had that the first year I was in that first class. And so I did that to become a personal trainer. The way the personal training set up, you know, if you work for like an organization like ACE or something like that, you always have to upgrade your um, your training. Mm-hmm. And um, so what I did was um, I would go outside of ACE and see, oh, you know, what's this like? What's this like? And um, I saw this advertisement for um, circular strength training. And uh, I went to Bellingham, Washington, and I did the CST course with uh, Scott Sonnen. And, you know, how it's, why is that relevant to what we're talking about? Scott Sonnen is the guy who kind of coined the, the term the saddle, and he's a Sambo instructor, distinguished master of sport, American. Mm-hmm. And um, he basically developed that leg lock game of the saddle, which everyone does today, especially no, if you're in no gi, that's a big part of the jujitsu. I don't think he gets the credit for it. But uh, he even had a video that came out that uh, didn't really go over too well, I guess, like as far as like it is, everyone knows it now. Mm-hmm. But uh, he doesn't get the credit for it. So I um I did want to mention that. I trained with him with the clubs and did that um, certification. But then afterwards, we went and trained together. And, um, you know, I, I learned some things about the – basically the, the thing I learned is no martial art has all the answers. And if you understand the counters to a martial art – you can counter it if you are on time and you do the technique right. And, uh, you know, from his end, Sambo, Judo, I think he did a uh, Sistema as well. I don't really know too much about that. But I was concerned with learning Sambo. And he was like, hey, you know, you can even, um, if you'd like, compete in Sambo. But you're going to have to get your throws together. Because that was just purely jujitsu, And... Uh, I was like, all right, yeah, well, when I get back home, I'll, I'll do some judo. I'm like, yeah, I'll do some judo for like two weeks, and then I'll be ready for sambo. Mm-hmm. And I got into judo, and I learned judo is its own thing. Mm-hmm. And so I never really, I never really had much contact with Scott Sonnen after that. But, you know, he, if it weren't for him, I probably didn't have never done judo. So then I started training at Judo America and uh, continued on in judo. So I think it's very important if you are a jiu-jitsu god, you definitely need to learn some type of stand-up fighting, whether it's striking or throwing, wrestling, learn something that you can do stand-up. Because if you cannot get the takedown, what are you going to do? Block punches with your face. So you don't want to do that. And so where does it all lead to? Where does it lead to you? What are you doing now? Uh, Well, I was... uh, teaching jujitsu at Studio 540 Mm -hmm. and doing a lot of privates and personal training. Um, As people probably know right now, Studio 540 is defunct, but um, I'm still continuing on with uh, personal training and jujitsu privates. And also I travel. So at a certain point, um, you know Mark. Mm -hmm. We, uh, another mutual friend that started with us in uh, jujitsu, another team guy, he had a school in Coronado and invited me to come, you know, train there and teach there. So I started doing that. And um, a Russian guy came in, a judoka, and he was curious about jujitsu and started training with us. And then he said, hey, you know, um, we need to see, we want to see some jujitsu in Russia. And he said, hey, if one of you guys want to come out, you know, come on out and teach, you know, I'll set everything up. And uh, there were no takers. So I was like, yeah, well, I'm not doing anything. I'll go. And so I ended up going to uh, Vladivostok. And so I've been going there like, um, you know, once a year, every two years and work with those guys. Um, I had a guy that I uh, that I worked with in Germany, Reimar. He owns a ten show. It's a really great school in uh, Hamburg, Germany. So usually on this trip, I'll go to Russia, Vladivostok, fly all the way across to Moscow, and then over to 
Hamburg, Germany, train with those guys. Then I stop over in New York, visit my brother, <laughs> and then all the way back here. Where do you have you learned any Russian? Uh, in every country I've been in, everyone's speaking English, so yeah. I haven't really had um, incentive to really learn much. How long do you usually stay in Russia for? Uh, usually two weeks. So you're tra- you're training in Russia with mostly judo based no, guys. It's sambo guys, just fighters. No, it's a <laughs> lot Vladivostok team jujitsu. Oh, so it's jujitsu guys. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean jujitsu is a worldwide martial art right now. Yeah. It's everywhere. Well, I guess I thought that because you said when the guy came to your school, he was a judo guy. Yeah, he was a judo guy, and and basically in the judo world, all this. You know that jujitsu guy. You know they're they're learning like if you go on the ground, you're probably gonna get tapped out. Mm-hmm. And so um, he wanted to learn something a bit about BJJ. And so uh, I went. And and the issue there is they're training with no instructor. Mm-hmm. They're just going off video. And there are some hardcore, highly skilled guys over there, and and women. I mean, like this. It's uh. I mean, in this area where we're training, before class, they have a sambo, and then they have judo, men's and women's, you know, and, and everyone's going hard. So, I mean, I think everyone needs to, especially here, Brazil, <laughs> get ready, because in Russia, they're like, they're doing, I think that it's Russian Federation of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> but they allow all the leg locks. Mm. So you have guys who are highly skilled at sambo learning. And, and if you're highly skilled at sambo, if you're a master sport in sambo, you're probably a master sport in judo or at least a black belt because the styles are very, very similar, mm-hmm. except it's, you know, sambo, of course, has the leg locks. So uh, you better be prepared because I think, you know, over time, they're used to something that you're not used to. And it can make a difference. When you say they're used to something. I'm saying like, do a gi tournament, and all leg locks are allowed. Oh, got it, got it, yeah. In 10 years, what's going to happen Yeah. when those guys can pee here? Yeah, and they're going to have to, at some point in America, open up leg locks for the gi. It's just, it's silly, right? Well, the issue is it's a sport, and they're looking at, you know, long-term health of people. And I can tell you, when I'm in a Sambo class, like looking at the Sambo fighters in Russia, I think everyone has at least one leg wrapped. <laughs> like everyone's hurt. Yeah. Don't you think it's a little bit too like the culture over there is a little bit different just in terms of like. <laughs> yeah. Russian culture is very different. Why? Because they're getting nuts more often. Like the guys yeah. with the leg, like you say, you see everyone with a leg wrap, meaning they kind of maybe have an injury or hurt legs yes. from leg locks and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, wait, but like we have, le- oh, no gi has leg locks here. Yeah. So we don't have that much of that. But then how you say like Russian, they go hard. So consider leg locks as being a complete part of the, the jujitsu culture or sambo and all this, but they go hard. Yeah. That's when you're going to see that. Yeah, and, and also, what is complete? I mean, if you look at, you know, having um, trained in judo now, your uh, um, Kano's original vision was you have a style where you can strike, you can throw, oh, you're still moving on the ground, I can submit. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think it's imperative whether you learn wrestling, judo, sambo, you need some type of stand-up art. Yeah. You know, that's the full, complete mm-hmm. system. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's tough to, uh, like, th- the kids that wrestle. Like, you, like if you if you start jiu-jitsu, I'm not saying you're not going to be able to pull this off, but if you start jiu-jitsu at whatever, you know, 24 or 31 or whatever, you start later in life, to get the reps in for the takedown game when you're a little bit more fragile and... Compared to a kid that wrestled, you know, six years old, eight years old, 10 years old through high school, had, you know, hundreds of tournaments, hundreds of hours in the, on the mat doing takedowns. And by the time, like, that's why the UFC is so dominated by wrestlers because they are, they have that in thing just embedded. They don't, they don't need to learn that. That's embedded in them. They know how to get that takedown. They know how to get out the takedown. They know how to scramble. 
There's a huge part of that that wrestling comes in, and that's what's when you start taking that and you just make replace wrestling with sambo, and now you've been doing that your whole life, which has takedowns. Yes, it also has submissions. It also has knee locks and foot locks. Mm-hmm. I wish that there was just something like unified grappling. <laughs> that's that's a vision, you know, um, that was kind of happening at Studio 540. Yeah. All different kinds of black belts from all over coming together to teach their jiu-jitsu. I yeah. mean, because... But beyond that, right, what you need is unified grappling where the whole world says these are the rules. Yeah. Like these I, are the rules, yeah. the whole world. So in the Olympics... There's no more judo, wrestling, um, uh, uh, freestyle wrestling, Greco. It's just like grappling, unified grappling. Mm. If you want, if you want to, like, if we're gonna get invaded by aliens that grapple, if we're gonna compete with them, we gotta unify <laughs> this. Unif- <laughs> we gotta unify this <laughs> pretty quickly. Yeah. Otherwise, they're gonna have a leg up because they've been out there, you know, in their planet. Sure. <laughs> and they're they've combined it all together. Oh, they got yeah. the unified grappling yeah, potentially this is what are we gonna tell the aliens jeff <laughs> we're gonna be like hey no uh, no reaping here hey no what, what is it no guillotines you know no yeah. guillotines from that position yeah. we can't tell that to an alien they don't care no, they're true. they're there to win that's very true unified grappling free the world you, you know uh, on that subject uh this might uh rub a p- few people the wrong way but i think when i look at jujitsu one thing I think that can really help is to make a rule set of that switched. Like in other words, if I pass your guard, that's three points. Make that an advantage and make actual submissions. Like if you have to escape it, mm-hmm. those are the points. We What finishes fights where you could actually have killed this person? Chokes, make those four points. And if I see I have the choke on and you're trying to escape, and you get out as four points. And then this way, people are going after submissions mm-hmm. more rather than, because I had a, a judoka, judoka buddy, uh, uh, Ross, and he would do jujitsu tournaments in the black belt division. He's a judo black belt. Mm-hmm. And he would win some of these tournaments, you know, 50 50, I, I would assume. But basically, he's like, I'm going to throw and stay on top and stay out mm-hmm. of submissions. Mm-hmm. And basically, he could do that at will because he's like a legit judoka. And that's that's a problem. Yeah. Now, if yeah. you do it this way, that's just an advantage. But you now you're forcing people to go for the submission more. Yeah. Right. Well, maybe that's part of the unified grappling rules. Yeah. Chokes, it is. chokes four points. Arm locks, shoulder locks type stuff. Maybe three points. BJJ doesn't like uh, leg locks too much. Make that two points. Here, here's the only here's the only uh, argument I'll say against that. If you're in a fight and you get a cross side, you get past someone's guard. That's a real problem. Like oh, in, yeah, if sure. we if we go to a real fight, that's why I think it's so advantageous. Well, that's why I think it's a big deal because they say, oh, if you pass the guard, if you were in a fight. You're got a you're in a much 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 worse situation than you were in a second ago, yeah. right? So that's and if you're mounted, even worse, right? Half guard, a mm, little bit, but so I think there's there. Oh, and if you give up the back, obviously in a real fight, that's the that's the biggest problem. So you remove the striking, but if you added the striking in, those positions are in some ways even more important, even more yeah. relevant. So it's almost well, like I'm not fighting s- philosophy. I didn't say the relevance of the of those positions are any less. I'm just saying for a sport to get people to go more for submissions mm-hmm. rather than, because we've seen it. Mm-hmm. Bunch of guys who oh, I yeah. wrestled in high school, I got the takedown advantage, I'll take this person down, wiggle a little bit to make sure the ref thinks I'm still doing something. Yeah. They stand us up. I do it again, and they won, and they never submitted anyone. Yeah, mm. and you they feel never cheated. even attempted a submission. Yeah, you mm. feel cheated. You're on the bottom doing guard the whole time and couldn't do anything because you got stalled out. Yeah, and stalling is a real thing. Like yep. you can, if someone's stalling, that's like a hard thing to undo. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, without strikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and then you add the strikes in. 
Yeah, that's a whole different thing. So yeah. you're talking about essentially like with the philosophy, uh, you know, of fighting. Yeah. You know, let's let's kind of keep true to that. Yeah. But for the sport, you're you're absolutely right. Like even if like even just stalling in general, like even if you're just up by some points that you got from all your cool takedowns or whatever, and then they take you down and you're now they're only uh kind of uh. They're only the only thing they can do really is tap you out because there's maybe a minute left. They can't score mm-hmm. 14 points in a minute. To not get tapped out, if someone's just the, my whole thing, yeah, you're mounted, you're side control, and you just don't want to get get tapped out. That's hard for the guy. You, it's hard to tap someone out. Like way mm-hmm. harder to tap someone out when their their whole thing is just not to get tapped out. So mm-hmm. it, yeah, it can be like an issue for the sport. So and it's you, like what sh- philosophy do you follow? You know, you still get the same result of guard passing and positional dominance. Because, well, what kind of arm locks are you doing when you're in someone's guard? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to do a Kimura to you if I'm in your guard. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so you, you're still forced to, I mean, those principles of Osakomi, those are all the positions, mm-hmm. right, of pinning someone. Those are still going to be important. I mean, in judo, yeah, there's no, there are no points for guard passing. Mm-hmm. It's just pin this person. Because right. I know if I have you pinned... If I want to, I could bash you, or <laughs> I could go into submissions. Right. Yeah. So that the advantage for guard passing or whatever isn't the points. It's because you're now you're cross side. There's your advantage. So it's it's sort of mm-hmm. like so use it then. Yes. If that's such a great you know use it, mm-hmm. but you're not getting points for that kind of stuff over here. That's the, philosophy. the Jeff Higgs way. Yep. And I'm not saying you know I, I'm you know it's just a thought mm-hmm. you know maybe it's a, a nothing thought, but the idea is to keep the purity of going for submissions in mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu. I mean, I think with rules that we're seeing in BJJ, judo is even worse because it's had a longer history of taking dangerous moves out. Mm-hmm. And that's what I see happening in BJJ right yeah. now. Yeah, well, I think the ultimate rule set for grappling is no striking. That's it. That's it. Straight no out. time limit, no submissions are barred. Um, just you're not allowed to punch or strike the other person or kick them. Other mm-hmm. than that, you can get after it. Yeah. And you can go as long as it takes. Which means people are going to have to, you know. Condition. Get up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but come on, let's face it. I mean, the sport thing, you know, you can't make the audience sit no, there I know, for, I know. you know, five hours. Well, I don't know. Depends people do, people, people do so other sports that take a really long time. And yeah. they manage to televise that. Baseball game takes many hours. Yeah, that's true. Right? So you would occasionally, you'd get some weird match that goes like nine hours yeah. before someone taps out from dehydration. That's what I want to see. <laughs> I want to see someone tap out from dehydration. <laughs> no, bro. You know what I'm saying? Because you're not allowed to get a drink. you got to go in hydrated. you got to go in with fuel in your system. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a lot different, I think, than baseball. But, yeah, because baseball, you have, like, understood little breaks. That's why we can hang out. Right. Can, That's why it can last can so long. Because yeah. in a jiu-jitsu, on no time limit jiu-jitsu tournament, there would be like a limitation just by nature. Yeah, that's just what I'm saying. Just by the limitations of yeah. humans. For the audience member, they're not yeah. going to be happy about that because at any moment, the match could technically turn around or yeah. something could well, happen. I do have so a solution I for that, too. For one, no, My solution know, for man. that is you run three matches at the same time. So two of those matches are going to, at least one of those out of three is going to be kind of exciting at some point. So you're just running three matches. You mm-hmm. focus the television over there. Yeah, I got this solved. Yeah, so what did I, I had a name for this. What was I naming it? Unified grappling. No, unified grappling, yeah, but there's just like no no time limit death matches, basically. Because it's you're the only <laughs> way. Cool. There's one way to win. Cool. Make yeah. the other person tap out. Yeah. That's the one way you win. Yeah. That's a sure. game changer. Yeah. Remember the Hickson tournaments that were like that? Mm-hmm. It was you, But you could also win by 15 points. Yeah. So... Those 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 matches would not go long. Hmm. Those matches would not go long. You could win by fifteen points or submission, and those matches yeah. would be like seven minutes, four minutes, ten minutes. Occasionally, there'd be some, you know, twenty minute match. Yeah, rarely. But the Man. Gracie uh, tournament is similar. I mean, they they give you points for guard pass, mount, and back control. Those are the only points, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the rest is. Continue until someone gets submitted, or or fifteen, 15 points. Yeah, fifteen points. Yeah, because fifteen yeah. points does show you win. Yeah. I mean, if you beat mm-hmm. somebody by fifteen points, that means positionally, if you were in a real fight, you would have you would destroy them. Yeah, it's horrible when you get somebody that's really good, like positioning, like an MMA fighter to roll with, 
and and like I'll do this with Taylor. We got a guy here named Taylor Johnson, and he's just a savage wrestler, and he's savage at everything. But you know, he gets a position on me, and I'm just thinking if he if we were in a fight right now, yeah. he would just he would be just killing me. He would be b- punching me in the head until I was dead, repeatedly, like <laughs> repeatedly dead. Because once is <laughs> <I'm talking. laughs> so it, uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of you. Like anyone who wants to get a seminar, because that's another thing. You know, you mentioned it, self defense, and how that's kind of what your focus is. It's really solid. Like you have your own little techniques in there. You got moves. I know you do weapon stuff. If somebody wants to get a hold of you to get some kind of training, what, what do they do? Who do they contact? I guess they could contact me. Well, how would they do <laughs> that? So this is an issue. Um, Jocko sent me a text last night and said, "Do you have Instagram?" And I said, no, I don't have any social media. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, I can give you my email. You can call me and leave a message. Old school, That's man. basically how, how, how Do I you know. have like an email that could be open to the public? Because you don't want to be giving out your email that you know, you're, you're doing your normal personal business on to a bunch of people. All right, well, let me, let me, let me make one right now. And then I'll set this email up. All right. So we will put that out in the future. Yeah. And I'll post it. How to get in touch yeah. with Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Echo, you got anything else? No, that's it. It's good. Good to see you again. Yeah, man. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Any other any other closing thoughts? Anything I missed? Well, I think um, right now it's a, a really important thing. We're looking at the, uh, I'm talking about the world situation right now. And um, I think it's really important, you know, with all these things going on, that we somehow get some cohesion. Because, um, I mean, looking at jujitsu, SEAL team, all these different ways of uh, destruction, it's a lot easier to destroy than it is to create. And, you know, as we have to start thinking on a species level, I don't really want to get preachy on people, but I mean, just something I see, um, if we don't do it, humans in general are getting so good at war and destruction that we're going to end up killing ourselves. And really all around us, you know, you have the universe. We, there's a wake up call right now. The whole planet got caught off guard with this virus. Luckily, I mean, there are a lot of people that have, have died from it, but um, the death rate is not like 50% or higher. I mean, what if Ebola was as contagious as this virus? So we have to be smart with what we're doing. Basically, nature, giving us human species a wake-up call on, got to start being aware of what's going on outside of our little bubble, the human bubble. That's uh, basically what I wanted to say. There's like a, um, this is, you know, a physicist. Are you, are you familiar with uh, the Kardashev scale? No. So a physicist was um astronomer looking out into space, you know, with his equipment. And what do you look for in space for life? And so he started coming up with things that he would look up, look for. And uh, he came up with these levels, type zero, type one, type two, type three. And uh, humans right now, we're a type zero. Oh, civilization. Civilization, right. right. Type one is when we actually have a really good control of the planetary systems. And then type two is when we have control of the energy of the sun and type three the galaxy you know this is all hypothetical but the issue is you know with um our capability at war right now we got to be really careful because if we don't reach that type one level where you know at we at a certain point we're going to be able to give um there's going to be food everything for everyone you see what i'm saying like over time humans make things easier mm-hmm and one of the one of the issues we have is all resources and stuff like that that are um, if they're 
in low supply here, you have that starts causing skirmishes and stuff like that. So what I'm saying is over time, those problems are going to be solved. But before we reach type one, at a certain point, weapons and, and how to fight, that also starts to spread. And then at a certain point, we can end up destroying ourselves before we even reach type one civilization. And type one, type one allows us to leave the planet? At a, yeah, of course, we'll, we'll be at a point where, uh, you know, we're not even type one now and we've left the planet. Leave the planet and stay somewhere. I mean, <laughs> no, type one is harness the energy of yeah. our planet, like all of the energy, not just like oil or whatever. It's like basically utilize 100% of the energy available from our planet, whatever that is. That's type zero. Type one. That's type one. We're not yeah, even there yet, obviously. There yet. Yeah. How do you know this, Echo Charles? I, you just figured it out? I read and, you know, we hang out at the same spot. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so but it, essentially, I'm getting at, you know, uh, we don't want to get caught off guard. And I see there's a lot of separation right now and, and a lot of social unrest. And we have to get through that to a point where we start to unify. It's very, very tough to do, um, but uh, hopefully it can happen. What do you see as like, when you see the, the disunification, like what do you see as things to move in the right direction of becoming unified again? Well, I think one of the main reasons is um, not thinking on a species level. And, you know, when I'm talking about this, I feel kind of funny because it feels like I'm talking in the clouds or something like that. But I'm just being really genuine and sincere about the human species looking at itself as a species and not as so separate. You know, in my travels, I've been, came from the projects, came out to, came here and became a SEAL in uh, San Diego. My travels in jujitsu, learning there, judo. Uh, traveling around the world, and I've seen all kinds of different people, you know, in SEAL Team, Southeast Asia, been down Central America, South America, Russia, and I see everyone really wants the same thing, basics of life, you know, and, and if, you, if you're in the military going to Russia, it's kind of a big deal in a sense because they were like the great enemy, and I see like uh, families over there just like everybody else. Everyone's trying to live their life the best they can. And uh, the separatism that we have is making a big problem. We're going to end up killing ourselves before we reach a level where everything can be better for everyone. Is that way, I mean, before I even continue, does that sound like kind of wacky or no, something? No, because you know what it is, actually? Like, you make a good point where it's like, and people got to point this out. Like, people, like, that's, I mean, that that's obviously like good that you say that people do say that every once in a while but that's a lot of time not what you hear so when like what you're talking about is essentially like you know how if you have you know you have kids mm -hmm. right where let's say you know i don't know you have a goal to get somewhere to do something or really just a general goal as a family where it's like okay our job as parents is to maintain this household, make sure you guys are prepared for life when you grow up. And when you do that, you're going to be successful in whatever way you want to be. And then you can sort of do the same and, and around we go, right? Mm -hmm. Same we kind of analogy. Perpe perpetuate it perpetuates. the species. Exactly right. So, you know, in, a, in a, small, a smaller analogy, it's like a family situation. But currently in our family, the whole world, we're kind of infighting. You know, the brothers and sisters will fight mm. and it'd be like, hey, he took my thing. No, no, he hit me. He pulled my hair. So he goes, well, you pull my hair back even harder. Oh, and now they're fighting. And then you're like, hey, don't yell. And then the wife is like, hey, don't yell at her like that. You didn't have to say, you know, so we're all infighting. Mm -hmm. We're forgetting about like, we don't forget about, I think we get distracted by just the little micro feeling or the, the, the short term things that go on. Mm -hmm. And we, we start to forget about, um, you know, progress, you know. I mean, I just, I don't want to come off sounding high-minded or anything like that. You know, I'm just um, looking at the world, per se, and um, what has just happened. Not just our country, but all over the world. Like, this virus has come out, and everyone got caught with their pants down. What kind of prep was made everywhere? Now, what if that virus was more deadly? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, would, so we have to be smart. Yeah. Would would that 
would that unify the world against a common enemy or would it separate the world more? And here's, you remember I had, I had, so I had a guy named uh, Peter Atia. He's a doctor and he was a doctor in the, um, in the trauma center, an ER doctor in Baltimore. And so I forget the statistics. He was dealing with something like 18 puncture wounds a day. So that's shootings and stabbings. This is Baltimore, you know, one of the worst crime rates in, it's actually one of the worst crime rates in the world. I don't know if you knew that. It's in the whole world, it's one of the worst crime rates. So that's what he's dealing with. And what he said was, when you have a family come in that's gone through this kind of trauma, usually it's the loss of someone because these puncture wounds or you know, stabbings or not everyone's as, hate to use the word, not everyone's as lucky as your brother was taking a seven inch knife to the chest and surviving, right? Most people are gonna die from that. And that's what happens. So what he said was, if the family is tight, if they're a tight-knit family, and, they, and this horrible event occurs, this pressure will make them even tighter. However, opposite is also true. If there's fractures in the family, those fractures under that pressure explode and it destroys the families. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're seeing right now and what you're talking about is, let's face it, in the world as a species, there's fractures, right? There's fractures with different countries, there's fractures with different cultures, and all of a sudden, we just got put under pressure by the disease. And what we're seeing now is we're starting to see these fractures expand And what I will, from my perspective, the thing that we miss, and I keep trying to say this in different ways, and maybe, I I, I mean, I'll keep trying to say it. You know, in in the military, what you end up doing is you end up dehumanizing the enemy. And it's kind of a goal, right? Kind of a goal to say, you know what? I'm gonna have to go kill these people. That's what I'm gonna get told to do. I'm gonna go kill these people. So you know what, I'm not even gonna call them people because there's some part of your subconscious that says, hey, it's not okay to kill people. So you know what? I'm gonna call them animals. I'm gonna call them savages. I'm gonna call them whatever. I'm gonna call them uh, krauts, right? World War II. I'm gonna call them gooks in the Korean War. We're gonna give them names that's not people. So now we start to dehumanize them and now all of a sudden it's a little easier. Makes that job a little bit easier to kill them. Okay, so that's war. That's what happens there. Well, what happens when you start looking at the different culture and you start doing the same thing? Because you're like, well, I gotta take care of the people. We're getting, we're getting pressured by this disease. We're getting pressured by it, and I'm gonna take care of the people that are with me. And what do I do? How do I, how do I be mentally okay with that? I got a good solution for you. I'm gonna dehumanize the other people. Yeah. And now we get separated and now we don't talk to them. And so that's what, when you talk about Jeff, when you go to these other countries and you start talking to people, all of a sudden they're not Russians to you. They're whatever, uh, uh, Ivan, you know, <laughs> they're a person with a family and it becomes, they become humanized to you. Just like when they meet you and they go, you know, they have this horrible vision of what Americans are like and then they meet you and you're cool and guess what? Y'all do jujitsu and you like footlocks and it's like all of a sudden it becomes human. But we don't do that. We don't humanize each other on a broad scale, which is very strange right now because we should have the ability to do that better than anyone right now, right? Because we've got all these communication systems set up where we should be able to say, hey, everybody, mm-hmm. l- look, l- l- let's let's be together. But instead we show each other the worst part of our of ourselves and and we place blame instead of taking ownership and that, that's kind of how we do. So instead of us unifying, as you said, Jeff, this pressure that gets put on us by something like this virus, all of a sudden we become more fragmented. And when we become fragmented, the ability to communicate with each other goes down instead of up. And the possibility of someone actually saying, hey, hold on a minute, you know, other human or other thing, Mm -hmm. wait, maybe you have some of the same, whatever you just said, Jeff, about like, hey, everyone's pretty much got the same goals, right? Like you said, like, hey, I want my kids to have a better life than me. I want my kids to do better than me. I want them to have a a nice, be able to be able to have their own family and kind of repeat what we did here. That's kind of a common theme. And it's the same thing in Iraq. You know, whenever I explain an Iraqi family to people, I say, oh, if you want to know what an Iraqi family is like, it's very easy for me to explain. 
It's like an American family. Like if you have you asking some Iraqi dad what his goal is, his goal is to take care of his kids, you know, build up a, a house, build the business so their kid that's what their goals are. It's the same thing when you ask an American dad that. Same thing. So it's across the board. We get in these situations where instead of we're we're on like a mass dehumanization yeah. mode. Well, how it, the relevance to jujitsu is there's definitely a clannish aspect to all martial arts. I train Taekwondo, you're training Muay Thai, you know, you're nothing. You know, mm-hmm. this kind of attitude of, um, well, and from my experience, going and learning a different martial art, starting from ground up, you see that the martial arts also all have the same goal of, I get into an altercation, I can take care of myself. Yeah. You know, so it's, I think um, learning mm-hmm. this stuff has, has kind of, uh, it, it's changed me in a way where I'm trying to, instead of compare and contrast, I'm trying to see how we're more similar rather than how we're more different. That's a way to, that's a way to say it. Yeah, and the other interesting thing about, let's face it, if you, if you know jujitsu, Muay Thai, boxing, wrestling, Taekwondo, ninjutsu, kenpo. You, if you know, if you know, twenty-seven different martial arts, right? Sure, and somebody introduces you to the twenty-ninth. If you have an open mind, you will learn something yes. from that other thing, mm-hmm. right? It's kind of like, I mean, back in the day, Jeff, you and I lived through this, where it was a jujitsu move or it was bullshit. <laughs> Yes. If it wasn't a if it wasn't a jujitsu <laughs> move, like this is a jujitsu move, then it's bullshit, right? That's yeah. the that's the old mentality. Like that is not a jujitsu move, so therefore it can't work, and it shouldn't be part of the system. It shouldn't be part of the world. That's a bad attitude to have, and it's the same attitude if you look at another culture and you're like, okay, well, there's a lot of things that in that culture that is doesn't make sense to me. What does make sense? What, how do you open your mind to say, okay, well, at least if I don't want to be a part of that culture, what can I take from it? What can I understand from it? How can I relate to it so it makes me and my culture a little bit better, a little bit more understanding, have a better grasp on on the world? And we we don't do that. Just like the old school martial arts, and, and specifically the old school jujitsu, was if it's not part of this, then it if it's not jujitsu. Don't don't do it. Doesn't work, and it's don't bring it in here. And that's the way. I mean, I think, I guess you could say like Bruce Lee. You know, he was kind of an early adopter. Mm-hmm. And you know, if it doesn't, you know, he had some great quotes of which I can can't think of any right now. But absorb it's absorb um, what's useful, discard the rest. There you go. Thank you. Absorb what's uh-huh. useful, discard the rest. So that's the attitude to have. And yet, what we like to do discard in martial them. arts and in life is discard everything else. Mm -hmm. We're not listening. I don't wanna know what you know. What you know doesn't make sense to me and I don't wanna be a part of it. (sighs) I hope, you know, I'm I'm not, and I don't have any um, misconceptions like, you know, we're all gonna be holding hands singing Kumbaya and all this stuff. I'm not saying anything Well, I for one don't hold hands with people, so (laughs) we're out there. (laughs) You can't get there. (laughs) <laughs> but over basically what I'm saying is over time <laughs> what people have now they didn't have a century ago you know humans progress over time they get better all people do this and the same thing with you know our war and stuff like that we got to find answers or we're going to end up destroying ourselves or in the fights against ourselves something else is going to get us mm-hmm. and this is a warning sign from nature you know, there's a whole universe out there. I mean, when you start studying things in science, like astronomy and stuff like that, and how really big and expansive, you know, reality really is, we're in a really little small space. And I know um, maybe to some religious people, you know, uh, science perspective is not really that great. But um, I'm trying to deal with what we know with some certainty. You know, what I do know certainly is we're in this life right now we want to make it the best we can before it's over and so that's that's why i was uh i wanted to put that point out and uh, on a on a on a personal level 
Like it seems like you're doing your best to kind of reach out the world and make that happen. Well, through through jujitsu, through martial arts. Yeah, I, I have to say, um, even SEAL Team. I mean, uh, getting in SEAL Team, coming out of the projects. I don't know anyone from the projects that's in the that was in the teams during that time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was definitely um, unique in that aspect. So um, you get introduced to all different people, and you know, when you travel around the world, same thing. And uh, are we going to keep doing what we're doing? Because I think the path right now might not be the best one. And again, with humility, because I know when you start talking like this, people are like, you know, shut the hell up, shut the fuck up, whatever this, whatever the case. Mm -hmm. When you when you look at the it, it's the the idea, I think I think here's here's the crazy thing: the most simplistic thing that you've said is the thing that people have such a hard time with, which is looking at all humans as one species. That's why when you put that video out last week, uh, a couple weeks ago. you saying about everyone being human, I was like, you know, that was a cool thing, man. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, especially right now in the state of the US, what's going on, you know, it's um, really important that we stay smart you know, because there is still this uh, virus out there that we have to be aware of. I was, you know, in my studies, I have a a, a book here on um, pandemics. Mm -hmm. and when you look at the 1918 pandemic, we had three waves. Some will say maybe even a fourth wave if you do the research. But the first wave was a regular flu. That started, I, th I believe, March 4th, 1918. And then over the next few months, in the fall, the virus mutated and then killed upwards of 50 million people. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So we have to be smart with what we're doing. I understand the social aspects that we're looking at too, that's important, but um, you know, the health of the planet too is also really important. We gotta look out for each other. Got to look out for each other. It's true. I think that's a good place to wrap this up a little bit. I Actually, mean, I have a question. Oh, well, okay. You said you saw that video that Jocko made uh, a few weeks ago. Where'd you see that video? YouTube. Oh, all right. Oh, he's about to call you out on no social about, media. Uh, you, you're one of those guys. You have social media, but you're always on private. You're that guy. But <laughs> I stand corrected. He's you're a lurker. Correct. Yeah, oh. yeah. He's, okay, I dig it. I dig it. What do you think? Would, could, you think you could make an Instagram? Uh, yeah, or do you, you just know, have no interest in it whatsoever? That has been my main um, thought regarding yeah. social media. I mean, like, just the idea of, like, let me take a picture and put it online and show everybody what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Just I, don't, I have no really um, no affinity to, to do that. It's a, I had a um, Facebook page I started. I actually opened it up, and then I never touched it again. Mm -hmm. I was having a weird conversation with my two daughters the other day. Sure. And um, what they were, they were basically saying they don't like Instagram. Because and and it's you know how you hear people say like, oh, it's comparative. You know, you compare, you end up comparing yourself with other people. Yeah. And oh, Insta on Instagram, yeah, on whatever. Instagram. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, you compare with this, you compare with that, you compare with. You're basically comparing your life right. with the absolute best view that everyone else has of their own yeah. life. Yeah. You know that they're yeah. posing in front of the Lambo or whatever in order to look cool. Mm -hmm. And and I, I gotta admit, I don't really think of that. You know what I mean? I don't really think like, I'm not really out comparing. I mean, probably because I'm like almost 50 years old and there's, you know, it's kind of like I'm just an old man that <laughs> doesn't, doesn't care anymore. <laughs> but you know, for when you're younger, you're like, wait a second, how is that person, how's that other person that's my age or a little younger, a little older, how they have this, Amazing situation going on and I'm over here, you know with not an amazing situation. Yeah So I'm not worried about you getting caught in that trap. Jeff. Yeah, you nah. don't seem like I think type. you'll be okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Instagram that's the one you just put up. Pictures. Yeah, you take it you, you can put you can put words under it, too You know um, you can film videos, videos. the videos yeah. can be 10 minutes long yeah. There's something called IG TV 
expert over here. This guy. So this, I, I, I'm feeling like pretty sad right now. Just yeah. you're explaining social media. It to is. Me. <laughs> well, the funny, the really funny thing is when I got on this path. God, I hate even using that word. I well, I started social media. Um, Tim Ferriss. When I got done with um, interviewing with Tim Ferriss, he's like, "Do you have do you have social media?" I'm like, "No." And he's like, "You should get it." I'm like, "No." And he goes, mm, "You really need to get it." And I said, "Kind of like, okay." I mean, he's a a really smart guy and does really well with what he does. I mean, amazingly successful guy and just cool. Four hour work week. Yes. Yeah. yeah so he's telling point. me like, you got a guy that's done what Tim's done, and I'm just becoming a civilian kind of. And he goes, "Yeah, you need to get yeah. Twitter." He goes, "Just get it." And I said, he said, I'll show you how to use it. He never showed me anything. But the good thing is, you know, <laughs> what he knew that I didn't know is that you, there's nothing to show. Like, this is how you make it work. You yeah. put, up, put little words in here. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that you'll find interesting, I guess if it's used in the right way, I mean, I've made all kinds of incredible connections through social media. All kinds. I mean, I would say 50% of the guests on this podcast, and I've had some amazing guests, were through social media. They DM'd or they emailed or they contacted yeah. or whatever. And mm-hmm. I'm talking, I'm getting World War II veterans on here and and Vietnam vets. I mean, incredible people that it's an honor to be able to have them on here. A lot of them come from social media. So I, I, it's a great tool. It's a great way to communicate with other people. And just like everything else in the world, if you do it, if you go too far with it, it can absolutely turn yeah. into a negative. Yes, mm-hmm. and there's some pitfalls too. Like people will oh. tell you stuff on on social media that they would never tell to your face, mm-hmm. just every day. Too. Oh, oh so you're it's talking like, smack talkers, kind yeah, of. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's that. If you go in knowing that, okay, that's a thing, mm-hmm. then you then you might not um, hit hit the some of the pit, pitfalls. Do, have you ever sure. had an, a hobby before? A hobby? Yeah, just like a hobby. <laughs> This no, like, I've never had yeah, a spider books, yeah, yeah. bro. Uh, come on. Yeah, okay, so so let's say your hobby is knitting, right? And you get home and you're like, okay, I'm going to knit some f- yarns or whatever. Sure. And that's kind of your thing. There's some people, their hobby, what they do for fun is get on social media and te- try, yeah. try and basically terrorize other yeah. people. Yeah, it's called trolling. Yeah, yeah. trolling. Yeah. And, I understand uh, all of that stuff, yeah. but I'm, it's just like I've just never felt like I want to do that. Yeah. Like, let me take a picture of myself and then post it for everybody in the world to start looking at it. It just <laughs> right. seems like a yes, weird idea right. to me. Yeah, well, yeah. In in that way, it is. It well, is weird. What I, I see it's a change in society. It it kind of um, almost takes away um, anonymity. You, uh, everyone's a star in a sense. Right. Yeah, you know, if, you if you use it that way, for sure. Yeah. Out yeah. There. yeah, but a lot of times, like if you have a business or something, right? And you know how, like, you're like, okay, I want to go to this, I don't know, chicken restaurant or something, or maybe even a place where maybe the experience there is more significant. Like, um, I don't you know, a martial arts place or whatever. And, you know, you can go to Yelp or, I don't know, old school, you go Yellow Pages, whatever. And you'll have the number. How to Dang, have are we talking t- about Yellow Pages right now? <laughs> maybe, is that happening? Maybe. <laughs> and, you know, they're like, okay, well, now I got to drive down there to just to check it out. I'm not even committed to, you know, so if you have an Instagram, for example, um, you know, you can see pictures of the place. You can see descriptions. You can see comments of people mm-hmm. that, you know, may or may not like it or whatever. So you can, you know, it is useful in a lot of different ways other than everyone trying to be a star, even though I think that's one of the more prevalent uses for Instagram, yeah, by the way. You Twitter's a whole the thing. The thing is you don't have to post a picture yeah, of, yourself. of yourself. No, exactly. You can post a picture of a knife or yeah. a picture of a wall or a picture of a plant or, or a picture watch. of a star or Every your watch. morning. Or sweat. Every single, single morning. Yeah, or whatever you're going to do. You yeah, can just yeah. do that. Today, so you don't have tomorrow. to necessarily, um, um, you know, just pose for pictures for, yeah. for yourself. With your shirt off or whatever. Yeah. You know? Flexing. You know how you, how you get sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I'm saying. But you are right, though. That, that is true. But then again, you know, what if you posted this one? Let, let's say you're doing a seminar. You post one uh, picture of the cool picture of the seminar or whatever. And then someone's like, hey. Um, you know, your shoulders look real solid. You've been working on them. Then you'd be like, oh, yeah, I got that feeling. <laughs> so the next one, you might be a little bit more compelled to let me post a picture with me, maybe like in some good lighting oh, or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the comments start rolling. You see what I'm saying? You see the slippery yeah, slope, yeah, though. Yeah, but then there's, but then there's someone that says, uh, yeah, but he's got skinny wrists. 
<laughs> right? And then all of a sudden you're trying to yeah. do wrist workouts. Oh, yeah. Oh, right? well, yeah. Me, and then, of course, that guy's now your enemy because he's talking trash to you. You know, so you're now you're back and forth with him. And now uh, you got to check to see what your friend said about that guy saying, that, you know, so it's a thing. You know, you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. I think you'll know. be all right, bro. Yeah, but I it's, think so it's, too. it's like, in a sense, like a public record because at a certain point, right, you're dead. Yeah. But yeah, the media sure. stuff is still there. It's like a record. Yeah. Maybe a hundred years from now, yep. they can access. Who was this person? What was this person like? What oh, were yeah. they into? It's like mm-hmm. a historical account of individuals. Yep. Yeah, no doubt about Straight it. Straight up voluntary. Too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got some friends that have, that have died, and their social media pages are there, and I'm so happy that their social media pages are there because it's like, yeah, I can go on there. Still alive. And yeah, still hang out a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. So there's definitely a positive in that regard. Yeah. Was that your question, Neko? I don't even remember what your question was. Uh, I didn't re- Actually, you know what my question was? Okay, remember when you were doing the eight pull-ups, the pull-ups, and you were like, I got the eight, like almost got, what's the qualifying thing for pull-ups? How many do you have to get? Back then was eight. Oh, okay. So you had to do 42 push-ups, 50 sit-ups, eight pull-ups. And you had to run a mile and a half in boots and long pants for I think 12 minutes and 30 seconds. And then you had to run, you had to swim using side stroke or breast stroke uh, 500 meters, I think in the same time, Mm -hmm. like 12 minutes and 30 seconds, something like that. And this is all in one go? Or is it like day one you do this, day two? Yeah, it's all like one after the other. So the the swim's usually first, Mm. then the calisthenic stuff, and then the run at the end. Gotcha. Yeah, and that, those those le- that level of qualification yeah. is so not prepare That's the you. Bear, bear, yeah, bear. yeah. Like if you're just a guy to, sitting to there going, well, I, c- "I can do eight pull-ups," I, yeah, I can make, and you're totally wrong. <laughs> you're totally wrong, and you're gonna get destroyed. If yeah. it takes you eleven yeah. minutes and thirty seconds or whatever, running a mile and a half, and you think you're gonna make it through buds, you're not even close. Yeah, they're. I mean, back in the day, and I'm surprised they haven't changed it, and they have changed it now. Like once you're in the pipeline. You compete against everyone else. So the way it works now, Jeff, is when you get to buds, Mm -hmm. in order to go into a class, they give everyone in the class a screening, uh, a physical screening test. The top 165 people go. If you don't make it, you don't go into class. And if you don't make it, I think, two times, you're done. Mm -hmm. So it's a competition just to get into class. See who gets the best score. So eight pull-ups ain't getting you nowhere. Is it like the enhanced screening test? Because I remember getting a budget. You got another screening test when I in seven four where everything was higher, like seventy five pushups. Yeah, I I don't know. Like twelve pull-ups or something like that. I I just know it's a competition. So the max, the minimum fluctuates because if there's a bunch of studs in your class and you're not good at pull-ups, they're like, oh yeah, sorry, you're not in class. Yeah, it's like later heats kind of. Yeah. The crazy thing is, no matter what they do to those standards, the same number of people quit. It's the weirdest thing. Mental. Get to the cold water. <clears throat> it's definitely the yeah. cold. The cold water. <laughs> the cold water. The lack of oxygen. And the sleep. And the lack of sleep. Yeah. And then, and then those are that right there is ninety percent of the quitters. Mm. I think. Mm-hmm. Then you have some people that you know whatever they got some weird. They'll get in their head psychologically and. And they'll just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they look, man, you know, you got to recognize that they're going to try and make you quit. Yeah. So if they see some kind of weakness, that they see they can trip you up, and they might, here's the thing, ego up or ego down, you know, they might be like, hey, no one's going to want to have you on us in a platoon. Listen, man, you seem like a good guy, right? A little ego up. Yeah. But if you were in a platoon, if you were on a team, I wouldn't want to work with you. <laughs> you don't look like you can carry your weight, and like mm. you're actually by staying here, you're at, uh, the rest of your boat pr- crew, you're putting them at risk in the SEAL teams. <laughs> <laughs> so even a good, like if you're a good-hearted person that has good intent, you oh, want to take yeah. care of your teammates. The best thing you can do to take care of your teammates right now is quit. Yeah, I'm jam you up mentally for sure. I could so they're gonna figure out. They're coming at you. Yeah, and when you're cold, wet, and tired, Shit and that's the other head. thing. You you know people. When you're cold, wet, and tired, man, those, start, op- those start options start <laughs> popping up in people's heads. And they start, you know, maybe they weren't thinking about it, yeah. but now they're thinking, well, I really don't want to let my teammates down, and that hot cocoa looks good over <laughs> there. I'm going to go get me some hot cocoa. That's it's what totally they had in sense. our class, Swiss Miss hot cocoa mm-hmm. and Krispy Kreme donuts. Oh, that's the if good you quit, and electric blanket yeah. if you quit. 
<laughs> sitting on the beach. So you're sitting in 58 degree water, uh, jackhammering, freezing cold, and there's some quitter up there with an electric blanket on and a hot cup of cocoa. Oh, yeah. They're calling you out. I laughed at that it's yeah. craziness. If it, it, so, you so if the guy quits, he doesn't just go. He doesn't just leave. No, He's no, still no. there. They they He's they, there they, they make a. Sp- a they spectacle. make a positive spectacle out of it. Yeah, them. well, here's the thing, though. And they treat him like a bro, too. They don't, they're not harsh on him. <laughs> okay. They're not okay. like, they're not like, oh, they're, get over here, quitter. They're like, it's okay. Yeah. They're, they're oh, just running okay. the whole psyops on to everybody. Me, to me, that's the worst part right there. Because <laughs> if you're just like, oh, yeah, here, here's all the quitters on display. Look at them enjoying their hot cocoa. It kind of creates this divide. No. Like, bro, I don't want to be that guy. It looks nice, no. but I don't want to be that they're guy. They're saying that guy's, that guy's actually, you know, he's, he's a good smart. guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a yeah. smart guy. Yeah, he's he warm. made a decision. Yeah, yeah. he made. You know, and it's a, probably a good decision. It's a good decision for the teams. He really cares about the teams because he doesn't want to bring the teams down. <laughs> Not like you, <laughs> 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 trying to hurt the teams. Mm, see, I, I think I understand you a little bit more now. Just a little mm-hmm. bit. I get it. Check. <laughs> all right. So, um, I guess we're all probably going to start training jujitsu if we're not already. I guess we're probably going to be swinging some kettlebells, working out, trying to get better, trying to humanize each other. Yes. We're just moving in a positive direction. Yes, sir. What do you got for us, Echo Charles? Well, we're going to keep ourselves in the game with what? Jocko Fuel. Supplements. Supplementation. Important. You know, especially when your body starts falling apart. Right? Okay. Joint warfare. Krill oil. Super krill oil. Keep your joints together. Bro, when yeah. your joints go out, bro, you're going to be thanking you know me what? when you're taking the krill oil and joint work. Well, yeah, no, super krill. Me. Super krill oil. Oh, yes, sir. Because the krill, krill oil is made with regular krill. <laughs> <laughs> regular yeah. krill has not been yep. screened. Super krill, they made it through the training. Yes, sir. And they're ready to hook you up. I, it makes sense to get, me, too. Don't get regular krill. Yeah. Get yourself some super krill. Yes, sir. <laughs> also, discipline. Both kinds of discipline, by the way. Uh-huh. The supplement discipline, okay, it's for your brain. For your body too, but you know all these things—they're going to keep you in the game, big time, jujitsu or otherwise. So, Jeff, COVID. Before, at the end of at the end of January, I went to Seattle, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Washington D.C., and Austin, Texas. And in each one of those locations, I shook hands with one to two thousand people and bro hugged fifty percent of those people. I did not get COVID. Matter of fact, it never even like it never even got after my immune system at all. I got the test. I'm not saying that it's like this genetic um, uh, thing, but it's now proven that if you're healthy, right? If you work out, yes. If you eat clean, yes. If you take vitamin D, sure. Also, discipline. Back to the discipline thing. We do have cans of discipline. Mm-hmm. RTD cans. Stands for ready to drink in the industry. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Those are good. Those are the, I'd, I'd say, actually, you know what, bro? I'm on both. I'm going to be honest with you. Mm. Got the cans and the powder. Yeah. There's stuff. something really good about just cracking open a cold can. It's true. And <laughs> oh, yeah, Pete, guys, thanks for the refrigerator, by the way. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Jocko's head is on it, which, you know, m- mixed emotions about that whole thing. But overall, good. <laughs> Big hit at my <laughs> house. Brad, they sent me this refrigerator with Jocko's head face on the refrigerator. Yeah. Very strange. <laughs> you want to talk about like Otherwise strange times? Good, COVID strange, right? The world strange. We got strange people running for president. When your head starts showing up on your friend's refrigerators, <laughs> that's some strange times. <laughs> that that's some strange times. Yes, sir, it is. Uh, get some milk. Get some protein in you. Protein's better than no yeah. protein for sure. Protein, which, by the way, the have you tried the protein that I make, Jeff? Because uh, if you haven't tried it, it's 100% guaranteed to stop Spanish flu. It's 100% <laughs> guaranteed <laughs> to stop Spanish flu. <laughs> it's been lab tested the whole nine yards. 100%. You don't have to worry about it. I'm yeah. one of those... <laughs> what, what's it? What's it made of? Uh, pro. Well, this, uh, I don't know all the ingredients, but I will tell you this: it's clean protein in the form of a dessert. That's what I do know. I don't know the ingredients. We're gonna have to contact Brian. What little, do you mean? What's it made food? out of? I'm one of those wacky vegans. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not it good because because it, it, no, because it's got uh, cassian. It's got the milk protein in it. Oh, it's got oh, that oh. and egg protein. So you're just out across the board. Yeah. You're, you're gonna have to. Uh, well, uh, you're gonna have to eat something else. Which if is, I do get COVID, I want to 
can of that stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'll go out in make style. Sh- yeah, yeah. Make sure I have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, tea. Jocko White tea. Yeah. You want something a little lighter? That's um, that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, yeah, since you are too. vegan, it's not only vegan, but it's also organic. Certified, Certified organic. organic. Oh. You see, think I'm playing around over here? Yeah. I got your back, bro. <laughs> I got your back, big time. I'm going to stop you from catching Spanish flu, probably <laughs> prevent COVID from getting in your system, and I'm going to protect your vegan rights right over here. Yes. Is there such a thing as vegan rights? It's just regular rights, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Isn't vegan rights a thing? I, I, not that I know of, but I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we could start a movement. Anyway. <laughs> So is we, vegan rights a thing? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. Oh man, just like there's no keto rights, there's no uh, other dietary okay, uh, philosophy. Straw man Keto-wise. argument. That's a straw man argument. No, it's not. No, it's not. Vegan is a, a food a dietary choice. Dietary. And it, there's a philosophy behind it mm-hmm. for sure. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I dig it too. But I don't. I don't think you can choose a, a that kind of philosophy and then gain sort of you know more rights. Or lose rights okay. for that matter. You see uh, what I'm well, saying? I'm going to start a keto right movement. All right. For sure. Well, I'm going paleo rights over here. Right on. Straight up. Right on. I got. I got to start paleo first, though. Yeah. Kind of a thing. <laughs> anyway, speaking of a thing, jujitsu, right? By if, the way, everything that we just talked about, you can get on. You can get on originmain.com, or yes, you can get it at the Vitamin Shop. Yes, sir. The oh, Vitamin oh. Shop B. What was the oh. first one? Originmain.com. Originmain.com. Yep. Maine, like the state. state. The okay. state of Maine. Origin right. Maine. Yep. Because of your origins. Yes. yes. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> also at originmain.com, jujitsu geese and rash mm-hmm. guards. Okay, these geese and rash guards are made 100% in America. Mm. 100%. Even the cotton that they grow to form the material, even that grown in America. 100%. 100%. It's a big deal. So, yeah, when we go back to jujitsu, we need a new gi if you don't have one already. Even if you do have one, grab an origin one. Yeah. And that's why. You know, one thing about jujitsu I wanted to say, too, for all those people who are, like, sweating the load about, you know, I haven't trained in a while. You know, I, I um, had an injury from the military that just got worse doing jujitsu. My neck got mm-hmm. hurt really badly. So I was supposed to get a fusion on a C5 to C7. And uh, I was out for two years. I just didn't train. So when you come back, you know, jujitsu is not going away. So when you come back, you will get better. All those techniques you've been working on, that stuff's kind of just gestating in your mind, mixing and matching and, mm-hmm. and forming into new things. You'll be better once you get your conditioning back. So yeah. don't, do not sweat it. Like a lot of people are like, I'm looking at these. I haven't trained in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the conditioning thing, that's going to be a thing, especially if you like to go hard, right? You're going to jump back in there, try to go hard, and yeah. bro, you're going to yeah. get When you come with. back, come back smart. Just nice and slow easy get yeah. back to where you, and i think it's also while you're not rolling do your conditioning yes, you know sir. it is a lifestyle you eat right train right you know you got to have your conditioning going on so you should be doing that yeah. in other words stay on the path and yes. also when you come back you don't necessarily have to ramp it up you could just go 17 rounds death matches come and get it oh yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so yeah, I get origin gi if you, uh, you know, when you get back into it, if you haven't already got back yeah. into it. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of stuff on there, originmain.com. Boots. Boots. Jeans. Oh, yeah. T-shirts. All made in America. All made in America in the good old U.S. of A. It's true. Also, Jocko is a store. It's called Jocko Store. Merchandise. Super original. Yeah. Creative lack thereof or whatever but hey man it works jocko store easy to remember that's where you can get uh t-shirts discipline equals freedom uh you know this one that i got on good you know represent uh you know a lot of cool stuff on their this hats one that i got on yeah def core all mm-hmm. day to the core all day all day <laughs> um yeah jockostore.com if you like something hey man get something also subscribe to this podcast uh you can subscribe to it wherever you can leave a review we will laugh at your review if it's funny and if it's cool Yes. And if it's not funny, it's not cool, and it doesn't have any layers, well, cool. we appreciate it. It's cool, still. too. Still. It's still cool. Do you, uh, like, when you're looking at comments and stuff, do you get a lot of, do you get some negative stuff? Like, people for, trying to fire it up on you? For this podcast? Yeah. Almost none. Okay. It's really cool. Yeah, Everyone's it's, super stoked on it. That's, um, that's awesome. But, yeah, you know, some people give some feedback that might be considered negative, but I look at it with an open mind, and I say, hmm. Maybe there's some adjustments I could make. <laughs> maybe I could do a better job. Yep. 
We also got the thread. We're almost out with a new thread, with a new name and all that stuff. I'll let you know. Grounded podcast where we talk about jujitsu. Warrior Kid podcast where we talk about being a warrior kid. Don't forget about the Warrior Kid soap, including killer soap. Irish Oaks, Irish Oaks Ranch ranch.com or on the Jocko store website you can get yourself some soap so you and everyone that you know get clean can stay <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff Higgs. Oh, Jeff Jeff Higgs, Higgs. Everybody. so the byline is is uh what's this called the the standard operating uh, procedure yeah. is I do a little bit of a buildup and then I say stay clean and you just took my byline. Yeah, man. So normally I would say, hey, so everyone, so you, everyone, and you and your family can stay clean. And Echo usually goes like this. Yeah, I but can. You, you took the glory. Yeah, man. It's oh, good. Man. I like it. And you said I get like clean, it. which is also, you know, the precursor to staying clean. You have to yes, get clean yes. first. For those of us who are not clean quite yet. Yeah, oh, man. man get this clean. is going down real quick. Um, so yeah, we got a bunch of podcasts. We got a YouTube uh, channel that you can subscribe to if you want to see Echo's. If you haven't seen this yet, Jeff, Echo puts ridiculously uh, crazy amounts of explosions and fire and uh, Terminator heads into his videos because okay. he's all into um, you know whatever that's called CGI. Well, I just watched uh, Terminator the other day, and that was what I studied in school too. What Terminator video? Terminator. No, I. I um, <laughs> I have a Future. media arts degree, oh, yeah, so my yeah. specialization okay. was 3D animation. Oh, I did, boom, uh, there you go. Um, Maya and Lightwave nice. and um, digital video, so video editing, compositing, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Humble See? brag. Humble yeah, brag yeah, over here. Well, well, hey, I, I dig it. I dig it fully. That. He's kind of like, um, you know, the enlisted guy that doesn't like the officers because they think they know what they're talking about because they went to college. Oh, yeah. He just... Yeah. He just, I just felt it. Whatever, bro. I, mean, I, I, I didn't it. even exude that at all. I'm like, respect. I, you know, he's a peer. We're peers in that way. Oh, even more. Yeah. We're peers now. Dude, dude. <laughs> that degree you have doesn't mean anything, apparently. <laughs> we're peers. See how I like to instigate things? Yes, sir, all I right, do. Cool. All right. uh, so we got a YouTube channel. We got Psychological Warfare. We got Flipside Canvas. Dot com where you can get visual representation of the path. Got a bunch of books. The Code, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, Way of the Warrior Kid, One, Two, and Three. Mikey and the Dragons, Discipline Equals Freedom, Field Manual, Extreme Ownership of the Dichotomy of Leadership, Echelon Front, my leadership consultancy, EFonline.com. If you want to talk to me and hang out with me and hang out with everyone on the Echelon Front team, go to EFonline.com and come and ask questions. We solve leaderships, leadership problems. That's what we do every day. Come and check it out. We're on there, EFonline.com. The muster coming up, Phoenix, Arizona. September 16th and 17th in Dallas, Texas, December 3rd and 4th, extremeownership.com for details. We do, we usually do an introduction to jujitsu at those things. I'm not sure what's going to be happening because of the current um, COVID environment. Because you know what, Jeff? You know what we do? What? We, we try and be smart. Yep. So we're going to try and be smart. And we may or may not do that. Uh, EF Overwatch, if you need people, leaders at your team, go to efoverwatch.com where we take leaders that understand the principles that we talk about on this podcast and they can take them and bring them to your organization. Also, America's Mighty Warriors.org. Mama Lee, that's Mark Lee's mom. And she has been on a mission, on a mission since she lost her son on a mission to help service members, their families, Gold Star families around the world. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you haven't had enough of my plodding platitudes or you need more of Echo's misplaced mentions, <laughs> then you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. Echo is at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. Jeff is gonna make some kind of social media of some kind and we will tag him and he's gonna post a picture of his face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, yeah, if you wanna, YouTube, if you wanna see what Jeff looks like on YouTube, you can come on here and check him out. We probably already know what Echo Charles looks like and apparently Echo Charles does not look like he, how he sounds. You know what's actually. pretty funny about that is I do have a client that I do uh, privates with mm -hmm. And I don't think he's ever seen the YouTube channel. He just watches, he just listens to the podcast. Mm -hmm. And he's like, uh, 
he he doesn't think uh, he doesn't has no idea what you look like, and he's mm-hmm. like he thinks that I think he thinks you're kind of a small guy. Small guy, yeah, I heard that before for sure. Apparently, Echo Charles sounds like a skinny white boy. Hipster, hipster, hipsters yeah. often used something like this. Yeah, pretty hip, I guess. But yeah, I, I, that does not surprise me. I said no. I, I said, Craig, man, this guy's a pretty big guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we'll get that. We'll get your social media. We'll figure it out. Hopefully, if not, we'll get you an email. And if not, we will find an address that people can write you letters to. Sure. <laughs> they can mail them. Like a P.O. box. Or yeah. Something. And if not, we can get smoke signals going yep. to Jeff Higgs. Jeff, you got any last words? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And um, I do want to uh, say thanks to uh, my family. Um, Fabio for showing me in jiu-jitsu, teaching me um, all my training partners and uh, Steve I will uh, kind of leave that a little bit anonymous there but big change in my life from him and also James Harrison who was uh, my father's friend and really kind of was a mentor to me and uh, gave me, kind of instilled discipline in me on what it takes to uh, overcome your life's difficulties yeah that's awesome and you know that that just you know it's a it's a great reminder that when you're going through life if you make a little effort make a little effort to help somebody out you know you can actually change the trajectory of their entire life and we all have people like that that did those things along the way and clearly that's a great example. So be cool to people. Help them out. And with that, thanks, Jeff, for for coming on. Thanks for your service in the team, obviously, your dedication to jujitsu. And um, thanks for being my brother for the last 30 years. <laughs> and uh, like, hopefully we can squeeze out another 30. Yeah, I'm sure we will. But there's no guarantees, as you once said to me. That is, this is true. Time will tell. <laughs> and to everyone else that has served or is serving, thank you for keeping the world safe for freedom. And to the police and law enforcement out there, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, thanks to all of you for holding the line. Despite low pay and high risk, despite the lack of appreciation that you receive, know that most of us are grateful for what you do to keep us safe. And to everyone else out there, just remember that life is not easy at all. There's going to be challenges. You're going to get beat down. There will be punishment, and you will fail sometimes, and that's okay. That's okay as long as you get back up, and no matter what, remember what my brother Jeff Higgs says, simply do not quit. And until next time, this is Jeff Higgs and Echo and Jocko, out.